Okay, so I will start with Roll Carl. Uh, Mayor Brown is away for an Ontario Municipal Board item, I'm told, but Councillor Singh is here on his behalf. Welcome, Councillor Singh. Mm -hmm. Councillor Carlson's here. Mayor Crombie is away on other municipal business. Councillor DeMerlo is here. Councillor Dasko is not in his seat at the present time, nor is Councillor Dillon nor Councillor Fonseca. All other members are present, except Mayor McFadden, who's away on a personal matter. Councillor Medeiros, I don't see just... A, here's Councillor Fonseca. Councillor Parrish is in her seat. We were going to check that off. Councillor Sato is here. Councillor Starr is my only other person not in attendance. Okay, at the start of the meeting. Uh, we move on to our Indigenous land acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather in which the region of Peel operates as part of the treaty lands and the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, Indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, we wish to acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Metis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land and by doing so give our respect to its first inhabitants. Okay, declarations of conflict of interest. Are there any? Seeing none. Approval of the minutes from the January 22nd meeting. It's been moved by, uh, I've got a resolution actually from Sinclair and Mahoney that the agenda for the February, uh, is this my consent or is this for the approval of the minutes? Oh, minute, minutes. The minutes just underneath, I crowded it. The minutes have been moved by Mayor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Santo, that the minutes of the January 23, 2020 Regional Council meeting be approved. All those in favor, show of hands. Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Approval of the agenda. Councillor Parrish. Yes, thank you, Chair. Under other business, can I add uh, a small item from the pointer on paramedics? Oh. Just have to ask a couple questions. I'm confused. From the Pointer. It's a paper. It's, there was an article uh, most of us read. I'm just curious if the numbers are correct. Okay, can you pass that around so that our staff, when the time comes, at least they'll have it in sure. advance and, and the rest of us do as well? Yep. I'm just a little confused that we're being asked to speak to something in the media um, as opposed to, but I'll, I'll let it work. You want them to respond to an article that was in the paper? I want them to answer two or three of my questions on how we service the airport with paramedics. Okay. Um, again, Councillor Paris, in the future, it'd be helpful to have these before us so that Just staff Just got it this prep. morning. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Approval of the agenda. I'm going to go over our consent agenda. First of all, let me acknowledge Councillor Parrish's point. Would you like me to vote on that first? The agenda is approved with Councillor Parrish's addition. I will take that vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. The consent agenda. First item I want to make a note of is we did have on our delegations an item 7.3, and Mr. Tom Halinski, who was here regarding the section 20, was kind enough to approach the chair and advise that now that he understands that item is otherwise being referred on to committee, Tom, you're satisfied that it be moved on accordingly and you will deal with it at that time and we can remove your delegation now. Very much appreciate that. Thank you. So moving on then, we have delegation items one, two, uh, seven, two, seven, one, and seven, four. But I will read this resolution as it relates to what you've just heard, that the agenda for the February 13th, 2020 Regional Council meeting, this is moved by Sinclair and Mahoney councillors, include a delegation from Tom Holinsky regarding a section 20 complaint under development charges to be dealt with under delegations item 7.3, that that matter now has been referred on at the request of the delegate to the committee meeting. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much, Tom, and you can be on your way. Okay, moving on with regards to the consent agenda. We have our delegated items, our staff presentations. I'm on to items related to enterprise programs. 9.1, do I have consent? Consent, 9.2. Consent, 10.1. Hold, yep, to be held. 10.2. Consent, 10.3. Consent, 10.4. Consent, 11.1. 13.1. Items related to human services, 15.1. 15.1. .1. 15 we will be dealing with, yep. Yeah. 15.3 as well to be held. 
as part of a present, sorry? Sorry, Councillor Sato. Can you say it again, which number? Sorry, 10.3, I think we need to give okay. direction on that. 10.3, very good, to be held at the request of Councillor Sato. And uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, could we hold 13.1? And 13.1 yes, as well, you. okay. I've just dealt with 15.2 and 3 that to be held. Communications item 16.1, 16.2, 16.3, 16.4, 16.5, 16.6, 16.7, 16.8, 16.9, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16.93, 16.94, 16.95, 16.96, 16.97, 16.98, 16.99, 16.10, 16.11, 16.12, 16.13, 16.14, 16.15, 16.16, 16.17, 16.18, 16.19, 16.20, 16.21, 16.22, 16.23, 16.24, 16.25, 16.26, 16.27, 16.28, 16.29, 16.30, 16.31, 16.32, 16.33, 16.34, 16.35, 16.36, 16.37, 16.38, 16.39, 16.40, 16.41, 16.42, 16.43, 16.44, 16.45, 16.46, 16.47, 16.48, 16.49, 16.50, 16.51, 16.52, 16.53, 16.54, 16.55, 16.56, 16.57, 16.58, 16.59, 16.60, 16.61, 16.62, 16.63, 16.64, 16.65, 16.66, 16.67, 16.68, 16.69, 16.70, 16.71, 16.72, 16.73, 16.74, 16.75, 16.76, 16.77, 16.78, 16.79, 16.80, 16.81, 16.82, 16.83, 16.84, 16.85, 16.86, 16.87, 16.88, 16.89, 16.90, 16.91, 16.92, 16
And that is exhibit eight. So let me see if I can go. I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we are. And I'm looking at the hatch line. I wonder if I can make that bigger for us. Man, this is sensitive, it's like my wife. Oh, sorry, did I say that? Sorry. I love my wife, she helped me get this together today. So please don't write that in the wrong way, folks. All right, so I'm reading the hatch line that you might not be able to see. Uh, the investigator spoke with Caledon Deputy Fire Chief, stated the emergency services would only access slash use the gate in the event of an emergency. This is the Deputy Fire Chief saying it's used as an emergency. And in this case, the highway would be closed. Very well. All right, so the indicated portion verifies what I just read. During an emergency when, okay. Um, until now, the additional time require, requirement was not specified. This time would need added over and above the response time of Caledon Fire and Emergency as well as Region of Peel Emergency Medical Services. Both directions of the 410 would require closure. So U-turns, let's go back to number three here. I'm sorry. Oh, wow. Where are we? Come on. Oh, I see what I've done. I seem to have misplaced the gate. There's a concrete uh, boundary in the gate. Uh, we can't make left turns south to our closest hospitals, and we need to close both directions of the highway so we can turn north, make a UE southbound to go to the, the closest hospitals in, Mississauga, in Brampton. It is our understanding that time estimates required to close and purge both directions of the 410 between Old School Road, 410 at Mayfield Road, and here Ontario Main Street and Mayfield Road have not yet been determined. And further, it seems they are not mentioned in the Caledon Fire Master Plan document number 16-3434, published and submitted in 2018. So here's the post-MOL investigation lane use protocol. This is the result of the new information. All four bridge lanes for typical traffic, zero lanes for possible emergency use because the timeline required to, to close the highway would well beyond the provincial guidelines for response times. In a sentence, the Valleywood Bridge traffic will double and there are no dedicated emergency lanes available. Station 307 duty load must be expected to increase as well when the Mayfield West Secondary Plan Phase 2 is added. Possible next steps. All right. Man, my heart is pounding. There we go. Um, I don't know if I can rotate this. I can't. Um, given that the EA was intended to be a transportation component integral to the development west of Highway 10 Main Street here in Ontario to fulfill pro provincial population mandates and further Exhibit 9 verifies provincial intentions. Let me see if I can. Uh, Mr. Chair, to relieve some of the anxiety of Mr. Harris, can we move now to let him go a little longer than five minutes? It might help him. Uh, thank you, Councillor. And the other thought I have is he's been in the absence of a specific... If you can just articulate, because I know you know the file well, speak to us like we're having a cup, if I can suggest, okay. and, and tell us the basis of what your concerns are, and we'll, we'll refer back accordingly. Oh, okay. I want you to feel very comfortable and talk to us, if you would, more casually, if you like. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, kind of at, I'm kind of at the last portion of it. We, okay. We're concerned that, and we have been since 2004, about the secondary access and egress. Uh, perfect. Yep. Thank you kindly. Um, so we now, in our opinion, we have the province is ready to be relocating the highway at some point. That's done. And if this one doesn't work for fire and emergency services and the liabilities, not just let's not even think about morals or human beings, let's think about the liabilities as well. This, this whole equation, is it not making us liable at some level from corporate sense? Not, we're, we're all in on the fire, I'm sure, and we're all in on the health and safety. And, so the EA, when we did our part two order regarding the Spine Road EA, if you'll indulge me, I haven't written this down, but I can show you an exact document. Um, right here. The minister, uh, Yurik. There we go. Okay. I've got it hatched out. Is it readable? Okay. And this is the decision table. Left is the topic and right is his response. This is the last page of his decision um, table. So 
you'll see on the left, concern that the project would restrict fire and emergency services access leading to safety issues within the Valleywood community. We cited this in our part 2 and this is the only reason we were doing a P2O. It was unaware to us that his sentence on the right, not applicable to the class environmental assessment process. So the purpose of the project is to examine the study area at a broader level. We were going in it to, to be kind of microscopic and molecular with our concerns. So that's why I'm here today. Does that help, sir? Okay, so uh, it goes on and it speaks to in his, his left side or right side paragraph, the town is aware of concerns regarding emergency access into Valleywood community, is continuing to work with Caledon Fire to address these issues. This was all written before the document um, came from the Ministry of Labor investigation, which is what I'm about to, uh, which was exhibit, uh, exhibit nine I, I read earlier with the hatched line. So this was third party, another ministry, they just walk in, they take a site of the site plan, and this is the result they got. The highway has to be closed, and that, was, that came from the fire expert of, of renown with the town of Caledon. My question for the region is, the region is in charge of the ambulance services, and so we're now bleeding, the circles are eclipsing a little bit, and um, it's, a bigger, it's a bigger picture. So as I move forward, I was trying to allude to the idea the province wants these developments to come in, and the province has already proven they want the highway to move. What about a concurrent logic so that everything can go forward and everything can be safe for everybody? I, I didn't think that was unreasonable. I don't know, I do not know all the details, the EA nuances and all that go with it. It's not our intention to slow down, but history will show on April 16, 2000, excuse me, <clears throat> 2009, I spoke to this room and everything I said then on behalf of our community remains unchanged, except now we know the highway has to be closed in order to use the secondary access. So again, I'm going to reiterate, there is no other way for people to get in and out of Valleywood, even with the wood proposal. If you look at the rest of the exhibits, now that you have the framing of my words, you will see that it's true what I'm saying. This is very concerning for all of us, and it's concerning from a, from a business aspect, a corporate aspect. Just, I'm just saying I'm not threatening. I don't have the means of lawyers and such. So I did, I went into the uh, Canada Criminal Code and I brought up section 217 to speak to criminal neglect. I don't know of a better definition for this whole outfit, all of us, to get pulled down on. It's me too, because I pay the taxes on the fines and the fallout. So it's all of us. So this really needs to get a, a good look at, because I think we're right in line with uh, Mr. Chair with, with, with concernables here. Um, I don't know if I can, I, can I just finish my last four paragraphs and then I'll be out of here. Those four care. paragraphs, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, given that the, uh, over, an overarching master EEA would tie all of the ongoing EEAs together to provide a true comprehensive vision that was absent when the existing 410 phase three was built. The removal of the existing 410 designation surrounding Valleywood would enable removal of the concrete lane divider thus further enabling a typical and reasonable second full access egress from Snellcrest onto Highway 10 Main Street here, Ontario. So we got the one we're using, it's fully occupied, and we'd have another one basically directly across from the Christian School, if everybody's aware of that. Uh, it's what the gate looks at, basically, is the Christian School, if you could look beyond it. Okay. Um, the same overarching master EA would also support Mayor Thompson's recent quest to identify and resolve the illegal trucking companies and as such, the uninventoried pollution that has likely been leaching into Peel regions, air, farm, fields, and therefore waters of the Oak Ridges Moraine. Um, further, such a master EA would dovetail concurrently with the needs of the GTA West Corridor and its ongoing EA. Further still, and we would argue most importantly, Peel residents would be safer when the 410 is relocated. Possible legal exposure from the new and relevant information will be minimized for all levels of government involved because due diligence will have been rendered to these human safety environmental issues. Uh, the VRA has initiated an FOI, this is um, just a caveat I'd like to throw in please, the VRA has ident initiated an FOI for additional information regarding what the Minister of Environment was provided as, a, as deliverables in his decision making process regarding our P2O. As such, we respectfully request the option of a rec recommendation pertaining to the same matter to provide 
additional or new information in accordance with your subsection 5.4-2011 of the Region Appeal Procedure Bylaw 56-2019 when the information arrives and it is reviewed. I don't know if I've asked that at the appropriate time. I'm just, I'm putting it out there because I'm a mechanic. I just do everything. Okay. We at the VRA are not sure why the Town of Caledon was unable to consider us stakeholders in this EA process as we were stakeholders for the Mayfield West Secondary Plan Phase 2 topic. The VRA hopes this delegation reinstates our stakeholder status to this and related topics and as such returns us to the contact list for future inclusion and input as today's topic moves forward. Uh, and then I've put the, the drop box for any of our information on our P2O and I really appreciate the extra time. Thank you. You'll stand in place. I have some questions. Mayor Thompson. So uh, it's not really directly with you, Rob, but thank yes. you. What I want to do is go back to regional staff and it's basically how can the region work with the town and the stakeholders to deal with the issues that Mr. Harrison's brought forward, especially with emergency services, that both the town of Caledon and the region appeal, which is the ambulance, and with the, uh, from the um, work uh, from the health and safety uh, group here that uh, Mr. Harrison's showing, um, how can, what can the region do to help look at this and how we can engage some of the stakeholders to get through these issues as we go forward? Because we have a lot of growth coming to that area mm -hmm. and I know we're trying to access the growth on how it fits into the EA, but the, I think what uh, Mr. Harrison's brought forward here is some valid concerns that we definitely want to make sure we've looked at, especially for health, uh, the health and safety, especially for emergency services. So uh, thank you for the question. Um, so the intersection uh, that and the emergency accesses that uh, that have been uh, uh, talked about today are really under the jurisdiction of, of the town of Caledon and, and uh, the Ministry of Transportation. However, um, the region, of course, has been doing uh, some extensive planning work in, in the area. We've been going through the settlement expansion for Mayfield West Stage 1 and, and Stage 2. And as part of that work, we've, uh, we've, we've required and reviewed and approved a transportation studies that have looked at the background traffic and the future traffic and the infrastructure requirements and, and all that. And that's uh, including, including this area and this intersection. And that uh, stage one work now is being implemented through the environmental assessment uh, that, that was done for the Spine Road. Um, that, sp uh, that environmental assessment, uh, as the delegation pointed out, has now been approved uh, by, the, uh, by the Minister, Minister of Environment. It does, however, include some conditions that have to be addressed through the detailed design. Uh, and that includes looking at, uh, looking at the, um, uh, the, the intersection, further discussions about the operations of that, of that intersection and, uh, and the em emergency access. Um, wh what uh, what we will be doing? We've heard uh, we've heard the concerns, and uh, we'll be reporting back to council on uh, on the upcoming uh, Mayfield West Phase Two Stage Two settlement expansion work, and through that uh, we'll be reporting a bit more detail about this. But we are looking at at uh, what appropriate conditions and, and policies might be uh, might be appropriate in that policy to ensure that the requirements of the environmental assessment and these issues uh, are addressed through the further detailed design. Um, and uh, and local planning processes, and to some extent, um, some of that's uh, some of that's already uh, in play. In that there are conditions of approval um, in in the subdivisions that uh, that Caledon's working on. So those are the, those are the things we'll be we'll be watching and looking at those policies, and again reporting back to council on. And this is where I'm asking with the region appeal, where Mr. Harrison's talking about us on that uh, emergency out access. Um, and it doesn't allow you out to the full line, full, full roads, but it, out to the ramps. This is no different than what already exists on the 401, especially when you get down near uh, between Waterloo and Woodstock and also down towards the south end of London. You know, they have gates across where they can allow service road guys to get out as well as emergency services. And I'm just saying, can it be something like that be considered? Because I think that is the concern that, that the residents do have in there is the only one access in and out. It's great on a police, you know, as the police said, that reduces a lot of crime because crime doesn't come into an area where there's only one access out. But on the other hand, our ambulance and fire truck are there and we've got to make sure we have fine ways out. And I just know on the 401, they do have those gates. And I was just wondering if that's something that could be considered when we're going through the final design. And through, through Peel, I know you guys are the lead on this, so that's why I'm asking the question. Could we look at it? Absolutely, we can. I uh, uh, think the, the uh, requirements of the environmental assessment do require further discussions and a variety of options would be looked at, including things like that. Yep. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just wanted to support what Mayor Thompson was saying and really for staff really to work with um, Mr. Harrison and the VRA because this has been a long, long outstanding issue for many, many years that the Valleywood residents have been expressing concerns regarding the one access in and out and with the gate being locked because I believe with the to unlock that gate you need I think ministry approval to unlock the gate and I think that that's the concern there because when the 410 was built and that alignment was built, a lot of traffic because people are ending up in Valleywood not realizing that they have to go this way. So I, I guess I'm just asking staff to work with Mr. Harrison and the VRA to address those concerns as we move forward and before we go any further really in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harrison, thank you for being here. I would add that when I saw the agenda, I reached out to staff as well. And I think the councillor and the mayor have said it well. We're well apprised of your concerns and we are working through that process as well. So thank you for being here again. More work to follow. If I can have receipt of the delegation moved by Mayor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Groves. All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Okay, moving on. Delegation 7.2, Sharon Main Devine, Chief Executive Officer, Catholic Family Services of Peel Dufferin and the, at the Honorable William G. Davis Center for Families regarding domestic violence and intimate partner violence in Peel Region. And I'll mention as you're getting your water, we had a session yesterday with Peel Regional Police. Uh, Martin Maderos, thank you, Councillor Maderos, for being there on behalf of the mayor. We spent four hours on it yesterday, and your concern was a top of mind concern with many people in the audience as well, as well as human trafficking, Councillor Downey, a uh, big issue as well. So uh, we're well aware of the concerns you raise, and we share them, and we're glad you're here today. How's the, oh, that's better. I have a good, I taught for many years, so I actually have a good loud voice, but uh, it's nice not to have to use it. So I'd like you to just imagine sitting behind me uh, 20 other service providers, because I'm really here on behalf of all of my colleagues who are concerned around issues related to violence against women, uh, and uh, on behalf of the Peel Committee Against Women Abuse. The last time I was here before Regional Council uh, was the fall of 2017, and it was to present uh, the Regional Council with a check. We paid you back for a $500,000 loan so that we could develop, build and develop the Honorable William G. Davis Center for Families. And the plan, that the passion that our board and the community had in doing that was to develop the Safe Center of Peel, which is that integrated service hub for victims of violence. So I, I just, I come with gratitude really for all of the ways that you've supported all of our work. Uh, regional staff are phenomenal and have helped us so much bring the community together and really uh, support the vision that we have for services for women, children, their families. Uh, and I'm very heartened by our community safety and well-being plan with one of the focuses of that plan being family violence. So I, I, I come uh, really with gratitude. And I also wanted this opportunity also just to help convey some of the nuances of the problem uh, that we're faced with. Um, I've been working in this field of violence against women for over 30 years, and um, I have never experienced the numbers of women murdered in our community. Uh, in fact, you know, here we are two months in with two women murdered. Um, and when we see that, that's just the tip of the iceberg because each one of those women, many of whom had children, uh, the children are, have also been killed in these altercations, uh, families are destroyed, uh, communities are also destroyed, schools, it it's just sends uh, a huge impact right across the entire community. Um, and, and one of my staff recently looked at me, uh, I think when the 11th woman was murdered, and she said to me, Sharon, what are you doing about this? 
And so that's what I'm here for today because all of a sudden I realized that we can't do this alone as service providers. This isn't something we can do um, without you. And one of the things I also want to make sure that you know, because you, you look at the data and you can see the numbers of women have been murdered. You know the amount of time and energy the police are putting into this. We know, you know you've got the data from PLCAS. We can give you our data. You know, we served over 3,000 women at the Safe Centre. Um, but what you might not know is that most of the women who were murdered were not known to service providers. We didn't know these women. And one of the things that we know is that if women can get to us, we can make a difference in their lives and we can help them. And we really need to get the community to own the problem. And I'm looking around to all of you as leaders in your community to really help us get the word out to the community uh, that there are services that are available to them. I think the other part of that that I really want to highlight today is um, that when a woman is being abused, um, somebody knows. But a lot of times people don't know what to do, they don't know what to say, uh, so nobody says anything. And so that sends a message to that family and to that woman that um, it's okay for her to be abused. Um, it uh, sends a message that nobody's really there and that nobody really cares. And so often women feel responsible for the abuse that they're experiencing in their relationships. So one of the thinking uh, of many of us in our uh, as service providers in coming together to talk about this is we want to transfer this problem to being shared by everyone in the community. Um, and that's really, I think, the whole focus of our community safety and well-being plan. Um, and I think I'm really reaching out to all of you to say, will you join with us as community partners to really take a stand together to say that Peel is a safe place for women and children. It is a place where families can come and thrive and that this is a community where abuse of women and children is not going to be tolerated. Uh, I think of the, the campaign, Women Against Drunk Driving, or um, Mothers Against uh, Drunk Driving, and how powerful that has been, right? You know, if, if we're at a party, you see somebody's had too much to drink, none of us hesitates to say, hey, why don't I drive you home, or crash on the couch, or let's call you a cab. We just all automatically intervene when we see something going on. Wouldn't it be great in Peel Region if we had the kind of community where when anyone saw anything, somebody would speak up? You know, where, where uh, you know, a guy could say, hey, buddy, it's not okay that you're talking to her like that. Or where, you know, uh, someone in a bar said, are you okay? Because what women tell us is if somebody had reached out to her to ask that question, it would have changed her life. It would have made all the difference in the world to her. So I'm really here to say, um, yes, support us through the, the service provision, but join with us. Let's do this together as a community to make Peel a community that we have in Ontario that can really lead the way in a public campaign to say that it's not okay. Um, so that's really why I'm here, is to ask for your help in that and to support us in, in doing that and to speak for the women um, that are unable to speak. Um, that's, that's, I think, really what I came to say, that I think we need you as leaders. Um, so there you have it. Any Thank questions you have? I mean, there's more I want to say, yes. but I think that's the heart of it, and I don't want to take too much yes. of your time. And Sharon, we need you as well, so thank you. Sharon, I have a list, and my first speaker, appropriately so, is Councillor Santos. I know the file means the world to her, and she's penned a marvelous motion as well that perhaps we'll deal with at this time as well when you've spoken. Councillor Santos. Thank you. Through you, um, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you, Sharon, for coming in. We've been having a conversation now about this for the past year. Tomorrow, 
actually marks the death anniversary of Ria Raj Kumar, the nine-year-old girl who was killed by her father, um, and her mom uh, is still in Mississauga. Um, and when that had happened, the city of Brampton had a candlelight vigil, um, and unfortunately, uh, we continue to see more deaths related to domestic and gender-based violence in the region of Peel, um, and the majority of which uh, happened in the city of Brampton and continues to happen. In fact, from 2018 to 2019, the number of murders related to domestic violence doubled from five to 10, according to Peel Region Police. And the police chief was here during budget deliberations and shared with us that the most number of calls that they get are related to domestic violence. Over 12,000 calls in the past year. Um, we've been working on trying to raise awareness, going to take back the night, going to the interim place walk, um, but it's still not enough. I think that in the past, in our conversations that we've had, we used to have messaging in women's washrooms to show where to get support and what to do. In our conversations, we, you had mentioned about Scotland having a very successful public awareness campaign regarding domestic violence, which has been very successful to decrease the amount of incidents. Mayor Patrick Brown, you mentioned Mothers Against Drug Driving. When the mayor and I were talking about this and possible solutions and messaging around a campaign, he brought up Mothers Against Drunk Driving yes. and the whole shaming of it. So what if we came up with a parallel campaign? One that in the women's washrooms and women's facilities shared where to find support and you're not alone. And on, in the men's washrooms, men's facilities shared, you know, it's not okay. Mm -hmm. And hey, you know, do some bystander messaging as well so that people like uh, who are good friends of these uh, men who need help and support regarding their behavior can actually have that conversation with them and know where to direct them. Punjabi Community Health Services, I think, is the only organization at this point who's offering support services to help men deal with their behavior as well. Oh, we do as well. Yes. We, we have our partner assault response program. Uh, and so we serve 600 men a year through that, um, that program just in Brampton and there would be another 600 in Mississauga or more. Uh, and there. you know, in our conversations as we increase awareness and education on the issue, that's gonna also create more demand for the support yeah, services. Absolutely. So we also have to continue our advocacy efforts to the province and ask for our fair share and appeal for support services around this. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, this motion that I brought forward in Brampton was supported unanimously. It is a collaborative effort at the region and every single municipality across the region. In addition to um, with Peel Regional Police, I'm speaking with them at their next board meeting on February 28th. Um, and let's come up with a proper public education and awareness campaign amongst um, all of us with the community. Find out what that message should be. Find out where it could go. And let's measure it to make sure that these incidents do, um, do not happen again. Mm -hmm. And I will say that um, Councillor Vicente and the mayor and myself had a round table um, with a number of schools, with principals and support agencies about mental health issues with students in elementary school in particular. And um, they shared with us that these kids are coming to school with mental health issues that are related to domestic violence at home. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's tremendous the impact it has on kids. And I think part of the campaign really also needs to focus on giving people the tools to know what to do and what to say. I, I think the human trafficking education uh, uh, program has been so successful because it's not just giving people information, it's given them tools to know what to say, what to do. Uh, as part of that. So I think we learned a lot from that campaign that could be adopted for giving people the tools. And in fact, it just occurred to me sitting here with all of you that I'd love to come and do a training with all of you to know what would you say or do in a situation. And then you become ambassadors for the whole community. It's just an idea. Mm -hmm. Just sitting here thought, you know, wouldn't that be great if then, you know, everyone here knew exactly what to do and what to say if they saw something or if somebody comes to you, how do you, what do you say to a woman? What do you say to a man? That's safe. 
Thank you, Sharon. And that's um, part of the research uh, that is done in bystander training, which is why I pulled out 13.1 with the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. But I think we actually also have to include bystander training. We could talk about that later as well. So um, this is the motion. Um, I'm hoping that all of council will support this. I know that uh, um, Councillor Downey has offered to second it, and I believe Councillor Innes has something to amend as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Sharon, thank you for coming in and for your advocacy. Um, Certainly, this is something that um, is near and dear to my heart. I actually served in at one point in my life as um, an executive director for a women's shelter, and I have seen firsthand all the women. <laughs> Sorry, all the women that um, that we actually house and help through that women's shelter, and I can tell you that some of the difficulties with these women coming forward is these women feel like they're responsible yeah. for the abuse they have suffered from a spouse or a partner. Um, and really, we need to get it out there, the message that it is not your fault. Yeah. This is no fault of yours. You don't deserve it. And really, nobody has the right to put their hands on, a, on another person. Yeah. And, and I can tell you, uh, on a personal level, I mean, I, I have witnessed um, domestic violence in, in my family with my mother. Um, and I, I, I will tell you this, I've seen other circumstances where it affects children and when they become adults and it's a learned behavior. And children being in that environment, um, sometimes they're emotionally scarred. I can tell you, I mean, I had a strong mother who um, raised us well and there's no scarring there, but this is why I, I have no problems in supporting you in your advocacy because I, I understand what it means and, and what it does to a woman. Um, so thank you again. And, and I certainly support having the, the um, really helping these men because we don't know the circumstances around it, why this happens, why they behave this way. And I think that that's the root cause. We need to get to the root cause as to why they behave this way, why they feel that they have to act out. And again, sometimes, most times, you see it goes back to when they were children and growing up in an environment where, where abuse happens. So um, I, I, I was going to second the motion, but I see that Councillor Santos already has a seconder, and I'm happy to take some training or just continue some more discussions with you um, to help promote uh, and raise awareness and, um, and just bring this to the forefront. And I can remember, Mr. Chair, um, some of you will remember the surgeon, I think he was a neurosurgeon, who um, killed his wife. These are very intelligent people. His wife was also a physician. There were signs of domestic, uh, domestic violence before. I don't know what happened. I don't know if the police um, got involved. And, and they did get involved, but I don't know how that works because there was uh, police involvement in that particular case because things had happened before and then mm -hmm. That's what it led to. It led to this doctor mm -hmm. cutting his wife up, mm -hmm. putting her remains in a suitcase, and throwing it in the Humber River. Mm -hmm. Those are the things, Mr. Chair, that we want to prevent. How do we prevent that? I don't know. So the Ontario Death Review uh, studies indicate that 90% 90, 90 of these deaths are preventable. We actually do have the information that we need to be able to prevent this. After 30 years, we've learned so much. There's so much that, that we know. We know how to respond. Well, I'm happy to work with you, Sharon, because I think that that's the key, is to prevent. And if you yeah. can prevent um, uh, this type of behavior, then you can really save not just that woman, but her children and, and everybody else that's involved. Yeah. And so the men we've lost. We've lost quite a number of men to suicide and the, yeah, through and this the process, too. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Councillor Downey. 
Thank you, through you, Chair, and thank you, Sharon, for coming. Um, we've had this conversation, you and I, very, many, many times. Um, oftentimes around this table, uh, I'm a huge advocate for the earlier centers and um, uh, foundational learning. And that's not because I'm a mom. It's because I know that the family home is a foundation for um, growth. And if that piece of the puzzle is not working, nothing else is working. We can work quickly and diligently um, to relieve acute pressures for human trafficking and many other issues uh, related to crime, but ultimately, um, as you and I have discussed before, the root of all of those issues is family violence. So you will always have uh, a champion here around the table and me, and I know all of my colleagues probably feel the same way. So thank you for coming today. And uh, you know we're in full support. I, I speak for myself, I'm in full support, and I think that um, ultimately, uh, we have a huge machine here at the region, and um, a communication campaign is, is a good way to go. Thank you. Councilor Ennis. Thank you, Sharon, for coming. Uh, and thank you to Councilor Santos for bringing the motion forward. I do have a couple of changes. So um, I do a lot of work with Family Transition Place, um, which is a, a significant service agency uh, for Dufferin and Caledon that deals with domestic violence. Um, they have been uh, huge advocates in education, actually have education programs that they run in schools to teach children about healthy relationships. Um, they run programs like mentorships, where they actually have men uh, partnering and budding with younger men to teach them about healthy relationships. Um, so I would like to make an amendment to actually add in the second last paragraph, family transition place. Um, as they are a significant service provider in our community. And I also would like to add in the final paragraph uh, the Ontario Provincial Police um, because that is the, uh, the organization that deals with, with Caledon. And um, I know from my experience in, in, in uh, working with Family Transition Place uh, and in Caledon in particular, uh, people think that it's not an issue that we don't have domestic violence. And I can tell you that the stats prove that that's wrong. Every year, year over year, there is an increase in domestic violence in our community. Uh, it may be well hidden, but that's not an excuse for it. Um, public awareness and, and conversation is an important part, but the education is very key as well. And I think that Family Transition Place does have some programs that I think would be valuable to incorporate throughout the region of Peel. Um, so I look forward to uh, working with you and uh, and all the organizations to to move this forward because it is it is an issue and like Councillor Downey has mentioned, uh, the family base is the base for everything moving forward and when that base becomes destroyed, um, that's when everything sort of starts to fall apart. So um, I fully support it and uh, I hope that those two amendments. I know we can't deem them as friendly amendments, but uh, would look to put those two forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paleshi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Santos, for bringing this forward. Um, thank you very much for your delegation today. Um, uh, we've spoken at the um, um, Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, mm -hmm. and um, some of the work that's going on there is uh, is really exciting, um, and bringing the parties together, um, parties that we or resources that we never really, or I never really uh, knew that were were out there, and, and identifying those. Um, I guess my my question around this is, I think you can talk to uh, different members and, and talk to different organizations, and more organizations might come up. So I don't want to ever limit ourselves to uh, some organizations that are on a piece of paper. Um, if there are opportunities for uh, for this to be, because we could get a, really a phone call tomorrow um, with. Uh, with more resources that we we weren't sure or we overlooked. Um, so would there be an opportunity to amend this to um, to capture um, any other organizations that are out there to uh, that can that can help with the campaign, Councillor Santos? Um, thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, in the therefore be it resolved, it just broadly talks about community organizations in general, and I think that should include as many as we think appropriate. The whereas part is in specific reference to the organizations that I've been in regular contact with. Sure. Okay, so and as long as it continues to be open. The Peel Committee Against Woman Abuse is a collection of 20 community agencies, so it's a great umbrella organization that pulls all organizations together. So Perfect. Um, when we're, Mr. Chair, did you have some? 
um, when we're when you're talking about you know when you're coming here and, and, and asking uh, for us to you know work with you and and um, I think that maybe in the past um, you know councils never really um, you didn't have the you may have had one or two advocates on on the side because um, everybody tends to uh, take up their own um, belief in what's passionate to them I think that um, in with today's council uh, whether it be at the Mississauga the region Caledon or, or Brampton I think you have many many advocates and more advocates that have ever been out there before yes. um, at the table so when you ask you know you want us to be with you we're with you 100% we're with you um, when you know, it, it's we identify uh, some of the uh, terrible tragedy, tragedies that are out there, and it and it. Uh, we often talk about how um, um, you know identifying can can really put you in kind of a dark spot where you, you don't know if there's hope, and you you're not sure. But looking at this and and seeing you know thirteen thousand referrals, uh, three thousand uh, three hundred and seventy six direct contacts. You know that's hope. There's people out there that are speaking. There's people out there that are making the calls. Um, but we want everybody to do that. Yeah. And that's why we continue to fight the fight. And uh, again, I thank you for uh, for being here today. And uh, Councillor Santos, Councillor Downey for bringing this motion forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Kovac. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to take actually a moment to thank Sharon. Um, I had a resident, not on uh, domestic violence, but who is a me mental health uh, sufferer, but a very much a high-functioning one. And he had a number of uh, questions to ask, and I actually reached out to Sharon and Catholic Family Services, and she came all the way to City Hall just to meet with myself and this resident and answer his questions one by one. <laughs> Directly, I also want to acknowledge, uh, while I have the opportunity, Brian Laundrie, who is here from Health Services for having done the same thing. And it really went a long way. And what it does, it tells me as a counselor how committed uh, your organization is, but also you are, uh, and you, how dedicated you are to the community and to helping those who are victims and those who are victimized. So I too uh, support uh, Councillor Santos's motion and thank you for having brought it forward. Thank you, Sharon. Sure. Thank you. You have the motion before you, but I think this one deserves to be read out loud. So with that, from Councillor Santos, seconded by Councillor Downey. Whereas in September 2019, Brampton City Council unanimously passed the motion for the City of Brampton to continue to support and work with existing programs at the Region of Peel at the, with exist, within existing who are providing services to those affected by domestic violence, including Peel Committee Against Women Abuse, the Safe Center for Peel, Interim Place and Victim Services of Peel, and to support public awareness and advocacy work regarding domestic violence and violence against women, such as Step Up for Her and Take Back the Night. And whereas the City of Brampton on Wednesday, January 29, 2020, unanimously passed the motion to work with the Region of Peel, Peel Regional Police, the community organizations to develop the strategies, a public educational awareness campaign to tackle the issues of domestic violence in Brampton and Peel Region. And whereas Peel Regional Police Chief Nishan Duryapa reported during the December 5, 2019 regional budget deliberation at the Region of Peel that the highest number of calls Peel Region Police receive are domestic violence related. And whereas the number of deaths related related to domestic violence have doubled from 2018 to 2019 in the city of Brampton as there were five reported deaths in 2018 and 10 reported in 2019. And whereas interim place reported 45 deaths in the region of Peel related to violence against women over the last 10 years in 2019 responding to 1,388 crisis calls, safely sheltering 147 women and their 106 children and conducted safety planning with 811 women experiencing violence and Peel. And whereas Peel Children's Aid Society receives approximately 13,000 referrals a year from families experiencing domestic violence and the Safe Center of Peel receives over 3,376 direct contacts and referrals for women and their children experiencing intimate partner violence. And whereas the United Nations strategies for confronting domestic violence include raising public awareness as a basic, basic operating strategy and whereas organizations such as the Elizabeth Fry Society, Punjabi Community 
Community Health Services, Interim Place, Family Transition Place, and Catholic Family Services Appeal support public education as awareness as one of the tools to tackle the growing issue in our community. Therefore, be it resolved that the Region Appeal work with the City of Brampton, City of Mississauga, Town of Caledon, Peel Regional Police, the Ontario Provincial Police, and community organizations to develop and strategize a public education and awareness campaign to tackle the issue of domestic violence across the region. Well done. You've heard the motion. All those in favor? That carries you now. Oh, we want a recorded vote, madam? So it will be a recorded vote. And that carries unanimously. Sharon, thank you very much for being here and for your message. Thank you so very, very much. It's a historic moment for me. Okay. Well done to all. Uh, moving on. Yeah. Good idea. Well said. Okay, we dealt with Delegation 7.3. Delegation 7.4, Brad Butt, who's also here with regards to Item 8.2, proposed change to the vacant excess land subclass reduction program, for which we'll get a present, uh, presentation a little later on. Brad, welcome on behalf of the Board of Trade. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, members of Council. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning on the staff report on the vacant and excess land subclass reduction program. The Mississauga Board of Trade represents over a thousand businesses in the city of Mississauga, including companies that own vacant pieces of land that will become future developments in the city. These parcels of land represent great opportunities for economic growth and development and should not be penalized through a tax shift as proposed in this report. Vacant and excess land uh, con uh, consume no municipal services and therefore should not pay the same property tax rate as if the land was developed. Further, there are often very good reasons why land stays vacant, including requests by municipalities not to hasten development for good planning purposes or review by the municipalities. Developers do not deliberately keep land vacant. There are many different and complex reasons why land remains vacant. Ensuring, for example, that prestige commercial industrial lands are protected and not, uh, so, and not sought to be rezoned for residential or other purposes. It may take uh, some time before a suitable occupant of the land is acquired and the land substantially developed. To eliminate the 30% property tax reduction for vacant land would be punitive and send a poor message to the development community which is working with municipalities on appropriate development opportunities for vacant land. We would ask that Council not implement the recommendations contained in the report and continue to provide a small property tax reduction to the vacant and excess land subclass. It is important that we ensure vacant land for development in Peel is competitive with surrounding jurisdictions and that we send the right message about good, timely, and appropriate development going forward. Thank you very much. Brad, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a list. Councillor Parrish. Yes, thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, to Brad. Um, I would rather report carefully, and I have quite a few concerns, as you've mentioned today. Um, what, one of the things that jumped out at me is Ottawa, London, Toronto, and York have not done this reduction. Um, are you in touch with their uh, large business organizations? Is this just they haven't gotten to it yet, or is there a position that they've taken that they're not going to do it? Um, through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not quite sure I can answer that specifically. There hasn't been a wider discussion through the Ontario Chamber of Commerce network that we're members of with the other chambers across Ontario on this specific issue. I know that there was some discussion among uh, Chambers of Commerce about the um, uh, commercial vacant unit space issue, which this council dealt with last year, um, but not specifically on vacant land. To, to, my, to the best of my knowledge. And the report is recommending this be implemented for 2020. It, in your opinion, is that, um, I guess I already know the answer. It's not fair to do it. It's almost retroactive because the next tax bill that goes out, that rebate will be gone. So there's no opportunity for them to plan for development. 
I mean, obviously, we're, our view is you should, be being, you should be maintaining the status quo. That's our position, that you not change the uh, way the subclass is taxed at the present time and that you not adopt. I think, I think the staff report does refer to a timeline when this council would have to notify the Ministry of Finance that you were adopting the change and therefore have it be implemented. But uh, our recommendation is that you not proceed. And other, other municipalities have chosen not to proceed with this either. So you wouldn't be alone in that regard. Uh, I also noticed through you, Mr. Chair, there's quite a few municipalities, mid-sized ones, that are phasing it over three or four years. Um, when you read that, would that be a uh, reasonable compromise to MBOT? I, well, I think, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to, uh, Councillor Parrish, I, I think we could have that conversation, and I will admit that your, your staff did have a very good process of engaging us and, and others. I think you have a letter in your, in your agenda from both Orlando Corporation and from the National Association of Industrial and Office Properties Association that have raised similar concerns. I think we could certainly go back and, and, and talk to your staff and work on this and see if there's a compromise by phasing this in over a period of time rather than doing it all in one year. That, that would be worth the conversation for sure. Okay, thanks for coming today, Brad. Thank you. Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Brad, for, for coming in. Um, I, I, I guess I have a question for staff, Mr. Chair, um, through what you. I, what I was going to suggest, Councillor Parrish, I still have you on the list at the appropriate time to make a motion. If there are no further questions for Mr. Butt on behalf of the Board of Trade, yeah, I don't. perhaps I'll ask you to stand down. I think we should take the staff presentation now, and then we can ask the staff Perfect. accordingly. I'll yep. acknowledge you then. Thank are there you. any further questions for Mr. Butt? Seeing none, Brad, thank you very much. And so with that, perhaps I'll deal with presentation 8.2 right now. Proposed changes to the vacant and excess land subclass reduction program. Presentation by Stephanie Nagel, Treasurer and Director of Corporate Finance. And Councillor Groves, you'll be first up for questions at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, ladies. Good morning, Chair and Councillors. Today I'm providing a brief presentation on the consultation and recommendation of staff on the future of the vacant and excess land subclass reduction program. With me today is Kavita McBain, Supervisor of Financial and Tax Policy. You can, yeah, thanks. So why did we review the reduction program? At the Regional Council meeting on July 11, 2019, the Town of Caledon requested that Region staff review the appropriateness of the vacant and excess land subclass reduction program and report back on the impacts of removing the program for the 2020 taxation year. Regional Council at that time supported this request. This review was initiated due to some concerns that have been raised regarding property that is left vacant and excess, which include that vacant and excess lands have been seen to have a negative impact on neighborhoods and do not support municipal objectives of complete communities. The lower tax rate for vacant and excess land may be a deterrent to the development of the property, and thus the reduction program itself could encourage a lack of or a delay in the development. And finally, the equity and fairness is a concern in that the tax reduction program is a benefit to those property owners of those lands, which is subsidized by other property tax classes, primarily residential property owners. Further, the province is eliminating the education portion of those tax reductions in the 2020 tax year. For some background setting, the vacant and excess land subclass reduction program was introduced in 1998, along with other such vacancy programs. It aligned with some of the changes as the province moved to uh, market assessments. In 2016, the province introduced Bill 70, which provided municipalities with flexibilities to adjust this and other similar tax rate reduction programs. The vacant and excess land subclasses are commercial and industrial properties assessed by MPAC as land without building or structures and or land that is not needed to support the current business there. In Peel, properties classed as vacant and excess receive a 30% property tax discount in addition to the assessment considerations already provided by MPAC when valuing properties in this subclass. For the 2020 taxation year, the province continues to offer municipalities flexibilities to adjust the production programs. Municipalities interested in making changes to the program must hold a public consultation with members of the business community. A council resolution and details on the changes to the program must be submitted to the minister before April 1st, 2020, 
in order to be implemented through provincial regulation this year. Once legislation is enacted, the region would need to pass a bylaw for the change in the program to apply within the region. So on that piece, as noted, consultation is a necessary step in reviewing the program and advancing to the next steps. During the month of October 2019, Region staff, along with local municipal staff, consulted with members of the public and the business community, including local BIAs and the Mississauga Board of Trade, with separate meetings in Brampton, Mississauga, and Caledon to discuss the program within Peel. Meeting dates and times were communicated to the public via news release and news stories, and both on the websites of the regions and local municipalities. In addition, an email was sent to identify business representatives across the community. An online questionnaire was made available for input for the, from the public for those who were unable to attend the meetings in person. Attendance at the meetings was minimal, with discussion focusing on keeping the reduction program in the region, similar to Mr. Butt's um, delegation already. However, there were no residential homeowners who attended these meetings. Responses to the online questionnaire were also minimal, with the support in keeping the program as it is a benefit to the respondents in that form of property tax reduction. So some of the key considerations, region and local municipal staff reviewed the impacts of the reduction program, and these were the findings that we had. The elimination of the reduction program would redistribute the tax burden, primarily away from residential property tax owners, and lead to enhanced equity and fairness between the property classes, due to the fact that the vacant and excess land reduction program is a benefit to the business community that is borne mainly by the residential property owners. MPAC factors in vacant and excess land attributes and land that is not improved into the assessment for those property subclasses already. And as such, the ability to then receive property tax reduction results in property owners benefiting from two types of tax relief. Property owners of vacant and excess land and other property classes are not entitled to reduce rates. And in contrast to this, to these reduction programs, some municipalities are, ta are looking at or taxing vacant residential properties through vacant homes tax. Historical review has shown from our, from our records and the locals that the vacant and excess properties remain as such for extensive periods of time. Over the last six year period, over 60% of commercial and close to 75% of industrial properties have remained within that class and not moved to further um, opportunities. And of the municipalities that were reviewed, 76% are eliminating the reduction program. Therefore, Peel would not be in a unique situation of reduced competitiveness should the program be eliminated. Removing the discount factors for the program does not impact region's overall tax levy. Any reduction to the discount factors would shift the relative burden back onto the commercial and industrial vacant excess subclass classes who are already receiving the subsidy and away from the other property classes who are subsidizing. As you can see in the slide, it just shows the benefits and where it would go to. This analysis was based on the 2019 tax information and the tax shift above shows that $6.9 million is the cost of the rebate fund program and is funded by mainly residential through 4.9 million. However, there are some other classes that are um, affected as well and that would come back to them. To show this in just a dollar figure, um, the program, the property tax decrease for the residential taxpayer, uh, the total dollars above show what the estimated annual residential tax bill using average assessments would be for the residential property after a reduction of this program. Caledon would be $20 less, Brampton would be $13 less, and Mississauga would be $12 less. This equates to a reduction on average of 0.3% in the region. Um, when we look at the locals, that's 0.4% in Caledon, 0.2% in Brampton, and 03 in Mississauga. So region, the region and local staff con consulted together on this and we were in agreement that based on the analysis and review of the reduction program, that we recommend the elimination of the reduction program in the region for the 2020 uh, tax year. That's the end of our presentation. Thank you for your interest in this and we're happy to answer any questions that councillors have at this time. Thank you and I have a list. Councillor Groves. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, Stephanie, thank you for your presentation. And I, a lot of my questions have been answered through the presentation. Um, uh, thank you for doing the work that uh, you've done and for reaching out and consulting with the community and different stakeholders. I think you've done a very thorough job. Um, I'm happy to move the recommendation um, of staff because I think that um, you have done your due diligence and you, you have um, reached out to members of the community and with the local municipalities as well um, in bringing this, this recommendation forward. So Mr. Chair, I will be moving the recommendation of staff. Thank you, but I did acknowledge, at the appropriate time, but I did acknowledge Councillor Parrish uh, acknowledged, was acknowledged first and she has something before me and I've got to take that one first under our procedures and we'll see where we go from there. Councillor Innes. Well, I do point of order because you can't take a, you cannot accept a motion if there is actually no recommendation on the floor. So procedurally, accepting a motion prior to a recommendation being on the floor would be inappropriate. So, if if that's your position, I I will challenge because I think it's inappropriate at that point in time. And I'll respond accordingly. I did acknowledge Councillor Parrish first, and I was waiting, and she yielded the floor so that we could have the presentation. So I, my ruling stands. Councillor Parrish was acknowledged first, and I made that clear at the time. If you wish to challenge the chair, I understand. But. Could I? Could we have comments from the clerk? Because there was actually no report on the floor before you accepted her motion. You can't accept a motion without a report on the floor. So what I, why don't we let the debate unfold and then I will take the appropriate motion and I will deal with yours first to challenge the ruling. You want to finish the conversation first? Um, unless you want to deal with that now, but we're still in the conversation phase. I'm not dealing with the motion yet. Okay, procedurally I think that it's incorrect, but um, I will continue forward. So um, the reason, uh, and I'm happy to second the recommendation for, for the report. Um, so you've, you've done a great job outlining all of the, uh, the pros and the cons, and quite obviously, in my opinion, the, the, uh, the pros of removing the, um, the, uh, the reduction is quite obvious. Um, firstly, it's inappropriate, I think, that the rest of, of the community, and especially the residential tax base, is subsidizing. Secondly, they already get a break from MPAC. So we're giving them a further break by giving them this reduction. Um, and so, but most importantly, and most importantly to the community that I represent is, uh, and you, you spoke about it in your presentation, some of these vacant commercial lands lie within our cores and they've been vacant for over six years. There is absolutely no motivation for these property owners to redevelop or revitalize their lands and what's left is huge holes left in our village cores. In my downtown core of Caledon East, I have a huge pocket that's been sitting empty. It's caused nothing but problems. There's, it, it looks horrible, the grass is long. Uh, it's right in the, in the community core, right in the downtown core. Um, and there's no motivation for them to do anything. And why would they? They're getting a 30% tax break and their property value is continuing to increase. So I think we have to use all the tools that we have in our toolbox to be able to revitalize and ensure vibrant communities, especially in our village and our downtown cores, and this is one of them. If, if we were talking about excess commercial land that is in the middle of nowhere, um, that may be a different discussion. But the problem is, is that a lot of these, these lands are actually right in village cores, and, and there's no, no redevelopment in sight. There's no interest. There's no move on them. Um, we've tried everything from different perspectives about bylaw standards and, and those types of things from the lower tier municipality that we can do. And unfortunately, that's not enough. Um, and to learn, and I would like to know how you know my residents will, will feel when they hear that they're actually subsidizing for that land to continue to be vacant and to look the way that it does and add to the community feel the way that it does. Um, my residents will not be happy. The other businesses in the community aren't happy because the businesses that are trying to, to uh, be good corporate citizens and be part of a vibrant community, they're not happy either because it's deterring from the beautification and, and the attraction and the tourism into the downtown core. So while I appreciate Mr. Butt's uh, presentation and, uh, and suggestion of, of why they don't want it to proceed, I would argue that some of those businesses, in particular our small businesses and our medium-sized businesses that actually employ the majority of people, those people want fair, competitive other businesses in their community. It helps them be vibrant. 
But when they're sitting next to a vacant field in the middle of your village core, that doesn't help. Um, and so I see that we're not only disadvantaging our, our residents and a residential tax base, it's also a disadvantage to those good businesses that are doing what they're supposed to be doing and working to revitalize in their core. So I fully support the recommendation. I don't think that we should be doing a phased in approach. We've had this conversation, I think, for the last couple of years. Um, and, uh, and as you had mentioned, over 70% of other municipalities are already moving in this direction. Um, so I don't see it as losing a competitive edge. Um, and I fully support the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Parrish. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions. I assume the province is doing this so that they can cut more money uh, that they're transferring to the education system. That's why they've done it. Um, I am not opposed to getting rid of it. I am very much opposed to doing it unilaterally for 2020. 63% um, of all the business and industrial tax that keeps the region going uh, or keeps the city of Mississauga going comes from um, industrial commercial based people who were interviewed and when you looked at the interviews they were consistently opposed to having this thing removed. I would imagine immediately but probably Eve, that was the worst part for them. When you look at the 76% that are getting rid of it, one of them is called Municipality of Oliver Papunge. Has anybody ever heard of it? Um, you've also got another one called Village of Hilton Beach. So you add up the killers, you add up the big ones, Ottawa, London, Toronto, and York, those are our competitors, mm -hmm. and they're not getting rid of it. So um, I think the problem, I've, I've got a particularly good one, the Britannia Farm. Our official plan amendment has changed it from a position where they pay no tax on 32, on 32 of their 200 acres to where they're gonna now be paying tax on a piece of property that's gonna take 10 years to develop. So at what point do we start removing this and hitting them with that? That property will never get developed. We've got pieces all over Mississauga that if they all came online in 2021, we couldn't handle it. So some of those processes take two to three years to get those. Uh, Councillor Dasko can tell you how long Lakeview is taking. So I'm not opposed to doing it. I'm opposed to doing it in 2020. And if you look at a lot of these, they're phasing it. And the question to the staff is if you do it or make an announcement by April 2020 as we're asked to, can you put phasing in, in that notice to the province? Through the chair uh, to the councillor, yes, you can. Okay, then. Um, uh, councillor Rass wants to ask questions. I see Councillor Dillon on the board. So um, we'll go back to the debate as to whether my phasing uh, amendment will work. Thank you, Councillor Rass. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation and the uh, report. A few questions. Uh, the province um, eliminating that education portion, portion, do we know how much um, from the region of Peel is going to be uh, reduced and, and how much the province expects oh, across the province that is not going to be going into the education system? Um, so I had to consult my expert over here. Um, it's about 50% of the tax portion for the education piece. All right, do you have dollar figures handy? Uh, do you have anything with you? No, not for the education. I, I think that would no, be we fairly significant anything. across the province. Yeah, the, actually the education portion is the more significant portion um, from that perspective. And the province has been removing, um, similar to the vacant, um, rebate program within commercial industrial. They've been removing those discounts on those programs um, since the 2016 legislation. Okay, I think it's a little short-sighted, but uh, when, uh, so thank you for the explanation about that the, the vacant land isn't about vacant properties that currently have buildings on site. This is strictly about really existing green fields. There aren't that many left in Mississauga, certainly. I think there'd be a lot more in, uh, in Caledon and parts of Brampton. Um, I, I'm not opposed to uh, uh, to phasing it out. I think perhaps uh, they're already getting a 25 or 25 to 50 percent 
discount on the education portion, portion regardless. Uh, so I'm happy to phase it in over a two-year period rather than a three-year period. I think that would be fair. Uh, we're also seeing um, you know, more and more pressures put on our residential tax base. So I think this might be a mer more fair way to, uh, to do it. And this is, retro this is for the 2020 calendar year, correct? That is correct. So yes. I, I think there is a little bit of unfairness in terms of, of timeliness and letting people know that this is coming. Um, certainly for a lot of people, uh, property owners with, um, with vacant lands, if they can't forecast these financial changes, I wouldn't want to cause them undue hardship as well. So there, I'm sure these are not all big companies, so I think that's the responsible thing to do. Um, so I, I will leave it at that and, and make that suggestion that we do it a two-year uh, phase in period that may be more uh, palatable. Thank you. Thank you. And before I go on the list, perhaps what I might do, just so that the mover and the seconder can consider this as an amiable resolution, that might be a friendly amendment that you support the main motion, but can it be phased in over two years? And you can think about moving that, and my other proponents can consider welcoming that. But for further discussion, Councillor Dillon. Um, through you, um, Mr. Chair, just um, just to uh, Councillor uh, Parrish in your amendment, you're asking for two years, is that correct? I or was asking that... for three, but I'll agree to two. I just don't like whacking right. them. So but I'm just wondering why, why three years, why not four years? So I'm just wondering where you got <laughs> three years from. Because I don't think four years will pass or I'd right. do it. So uh, <laughs> You've got to sometimes I, go for what you can get. <laughs> right. So if you had done four years, I would have, I, I'd support it. And um, um, I think what the region and the local municipalities kind of need to do is um, to do better in terms of supporting um, some of the business who's, businesses who are ready to develop uh, and actually speed some of the processes up. I know particularly in, in Ward 9 and 10, uh, we've had uh, some some people who are ready to go and develop, but there's so much red tape uh, that they've not been able to. It's been years, whether you're talking about TRCA or Arterial Roads or uh, the 413. Um, I, I think we shouldn't necessarily, sorry, I'm just trying to, there's a lot of surrounding noise. Uh, we shouldn't necessarily uh, judge everybody. There's, a, there's some smaller business owners, there might be some bigger ones as well who've been sitting on it, but uh, some people are ready to go. And so uh, I wouldn't have minded four years, um, particularly uh, in Brampton, something that I've been uh, working towards is getting more business to come. And so um, our just yesterday in our budget discussions, we were talking about the uh, um, the tax split, we have 80% of our taxes being paid by residents. So I can absolutely um, understand why we wouldn't want them to put, put our taxpayers in a situation where they're covering for businesses, but at the same time, like I said, some people are ready to go. And I think um, in Brampton in particular, we need more business. Uh, and, and I think whatever we can do to encourage them uh, to come to Brampton, and obviously Mississauga as well, uh, I think we need to do that, but I think um, suddenly cutting it off might not be the best uh, answer. So I think a phase-in approach uh, is the appropriate one. But um, I'm just wondering if staff could even comment uh, as well if what their perception is of, sorry, what they what they see the difference is between a two and maybe a three and a four-year uh, difference. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So I mean, it's council's decision whether we go with a, an immediate uh, phase in this year or if we phase it in over two, three, four years. It's a 30% discount. So you know the three year is 10% per year. It's, it's, it's really just a mathematical calculation. I will say, however, that um, in discussions with the local municipality staff, they were all pushing for the 2020 um, introduction of this, this reduction. So. Um, staff and the municipalities were in, in concurrence with uh, with that. So, um, with the staff from the locals and the provinces moving to the 2020, that's and the 
you know, looking at that, that was why our recommendation came in as a 2020 reduction. Um, but it is council's decision. It's just um, it's just a difference in when the, the shift would happen. So depending on the number of years, it's a, a greater time frame for the shift to happen back from resident or to the residential class um, supporting right. the reduction. There is no additional tax dollars in this mix. It's just about who's paying for those taxes. Right. So I'll support Councillor uh, Parrish's uh, amendment. Thank you, Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just want to have some clarification. If we're talking two years, which I'm, I'm happy to support two years, um, what are the timelines? Are we talking 2021? Are we talking the first quarter of 2022? What are those timelines? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Groves, um, again, it'll be dependent on the final resolution of council um, to staff. We do have to have uh, the information into the minister by April 1st, what, whatever we are deciding on the program. So it could be it, it, on April 1st that we re, we go to the province and say we're doing uh, the first 15% in 2020 and the next 15 in 2021. Um, that would probably make the most sense, but but it would be up to council however we phrase the resolution. Yeah, and and I would I would be happy in supporting that, and I know that my colleague here would also be happy in supporting that 15% in 2020, 15% in 2021, um, and like Councillor Innes, I I too have in my ward um, many pieces of vacant land, and we've been hearing that from our residents for years now, um, and also to your point with the other property owners who are picking up the um, the burden with this reduction. So, you know, I've got a piece of property that um, Loblaws has got sitting there. They've been sitting on it for 15 years. It's right in, in, in the gateway of Bolton, and uh, they don't maintain it, and it's always problematic, and they don't want to sell it because they don't need the money. Um, so it's properties like this, and how many more of those do we have? We have quite a few. So I'm okay with... Um, with the 15% this year and 15 in 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sato. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was thinking 10 and 20, but uh, only because it's mid-year. That, that's the only thing is because it's mid-year. And had we brought this in when we were approving the budget at that time, I think it would have been... Um, I, I, I think it would have been a more fair. However, having said that, I quite frankly think that um, the owners of these lands have been getting a really good deal for a long time, since 1998, when we put brought the reduction in. And, you know, back then, there, we were trying to develop, we were trying to attract the business to the region of Peel and to the municipalities. Um, you know, they, they already get the MPAC reduction in assessment, so they're already paying less. Um, it's not impacting those businesses that are already existing. So as far as our commercial and industrial business that provides taxes already to the city of Mississauga and the region of Peel, they're not impacted unless somewhere else they own um, additional vacant land. Most of the vacant land in Mississauga has been developed. I still have some, and I think uh, Councillor uh, Parrish still has some. But our biggest, you know, if you talk about a competitor, uh, like I don't think this is a driver on whether businesses build in the region of Peel or not. Our biggest uh, competitor for Mississauga, besides Brampton, and that's fine because it's all developing just north of us and there's a lot of industrial commercial development going on, a lot of jobs being provided, is, um, and again, to the west, to Milton and Halton, they've already removed the reduction. So I don't see it as a really big deal. Um, I think it's time. It's probably well, well overdue for us to remove this and stop having the residential taxpayers subsidizing commercial industrial. You know, it, um, and, and, you know, when you said for the survey and for the meetings that you didn't have any residents commenting, well, they wouldn't understand this at all. You know, it's not something that I would really expect um, expect them to. So, I mean, I'm fine with 1515 um, for 2020 and 2021. I was okay with 10 and 20 only because of the timing of it coming forward. Although we're still we're still only in the middle of February, so it's probably early enough in the year 
that uh, that we could do that. But I certainly support the motion that we move ahead on it and, in fairness, do it over two years. I would not support three or four. Uh, I think it's, um, you know, it's been, what, two, 2017 since the province said we could do this. So um, I think they've had enough warning that it was coming down the road and seeing what other municipalities are doing. But thank you. It was an excellent presentation. Very clear, very understandable. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ras. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was just, I just wanted to say thank you again, but I misspoke earlier. And having chatted with Councillor Parrish, I just want to be clear so everybody else knows because I was um, not understanding. By the province eliminating the education portion of the reduction, they're actually going to be receiving more funding for education. Yes. Not the opposite. And I have was having a bit of a brain malfunction issue there. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Pileschi. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Councillor Raz, for the confession. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I can get behind this, uh, um, uh, this recommendation. I think that uh, this serves uh, Brampton um, a lot better going forward with the um, opportunities to, and I wanted to use your words, but now I can't find where it was, encourage landowners to, uh, uh, to develop. <clears throat> I think the, the Achilles in, in my particular area, and this will be big for Councillor Dillon as well, is the infill sites and the residents that come out in, um, in the numbers uh, with this potentially moving us away from that and developing as a whole and um, also increasing the opportunity for employment in those areas, this is uh, this is definitely the right way to go. I'm not sure about the whole phased-in uh, approach. We'll see how that uh, unfolds, but I think this is uh, this is time, in particular, when other municipalities of lesser size have already gone this route. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. That exhausts my list of speakers. Uh, let me first say, Councillor Innes, I fundamentally agree with the point that you made. No question whatsoever procedurally. But sometimes as chair, you let a conversation evolve and maybe you end up at a consensus and maybe that's where we've ended. The actual motion I have me, the first one that I will acknowledge is Councillor Groves. Councillor Innes, you seconded it. But now as the mover of the motion, Councillor Groves, you're willing to accept that two-year phase in. Councillor Innes, you're still willing to second that motion? Yes, but it's as an amendment, correct? As an amendment, yes. absolutely correct. Yes. Okay, so we have it before us. Uh, do I have speak? We've taken our clarification. There it is before you. I'll take you, uh, give you all a moment to satisfy yourselves that that's what the consensus that we've landed on. And that being the case, I now call for the recorded vote, the electronic vote. What's before you? No, I'm taking the motion as is because uh, Councillor Innes and the main mover was willing to accept it as a friendly amendment. And that carries. Thank you. Thank you to all. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Brad. And I do need a motion on the floor to receive the two deputations, the staff report, and Mr. Butt, moved by Councillor Rass, seconded by Mayor Thompson. All those in favor, that is carried. Thank you to all. Uh, I was mentioned to me that uh, somebody may have dropped a credit card in back. There was a credit card picked up in behind of. Okay. Okay. Okay, moving on. That brings us to staff presentations. Item 8.1 update on the Novell Corona. Uh, con my God, coronavirus oral presentation from Dr. Jessica Hopkins. Dr. Hopkins. So good morning, I'm going to provide an update on the novel coronavirus outbreak which continues globally. Um, currently there are more than 60,000 cases around the world, most of those being in mainland China. There have been 1,370 deaths, again most in mainland China. Canada has seen seven cases, three in Ontario and four in British Columbia, and there have been no cases in Peel region. The risk of community transmission continues to remain low in Peel. 
In terms of what we're doing to respond, public health continues to dedicate significant resources to ensuring we are prepared for any cases of novel coronavirus in Peel. This includes reviewing and collating information from many sources about novel coronavirus to use in public health planning and share with key partners for their planning and preparedness. Coordinating activities with key partners at the federal, provincial, and local level, including the Public Health Agency of Canada, the Ministry of Health, Public Health Ontario, paramedics, hospitals, and many more, to appropriately screen, assess, and test persons under investigation using appropriate infection prevention and control measures and also sharing accurate and timely information with the community and partners, including schools, daycares, workplaces, and the general public. In terms of what you can do to best protect yourself, your family, and the community, it's the same things I said last time. Stay home if you are sick, wash your hands regularly, and make sure that you're covering coughs and sneezes with tissue or your arm. Uh, the Peel Region website is being updated on a very regular basis with information and one of the new areas I wanted to draw your attention to is a document we've produced uh, called Spreading Facts, Not Misconceptions. Uh, and I wanted to highlight an area that we get quite a number of questions on, which is about masks. There are many misconceptions about mask use, particularly in public. And wearing face masks can be very useful in preventing the spread of novel coronavirus if they're worn by someone who is ill. They're also useful for healthcare providers who are caring for people who are ill because it protects them. But masks are not recommended for healthy people in public settings as there's a higher risk of contamination when they're not disposed of or worn properly. So in terms of next steps, public health is going to continue to keep regional council and the community up to date on important developments related to the novel coronavirus outbreak. And regular updates will continue to be provided at regional council meetings and through the regular email that goes out to councillors. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Pileshi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what have we done differently um, um, when we were dealing with SARS? To, to what we're dealing with now with coronavirus? So through the chair, so public health and the healthcare sector have come a long way since SARS. There's much more planning that occurs in coordination. So we have uh, groups of healthcare organizations that meet um, to talk about how we can respond. There's been a lot done in terms of pandemic preparedness. And then infection prevention and control guidance is significantly different than it was back in the days of SARS. Uh, so things that seemed really new at that point in time are now routine. So every person who comes into a healthcare facility, be it a hospital or a family doctor's office, you will see signage there now asking, do you have symptoms of a fever? Do you have a cough? So that's acute respiratory illness screening. And that happens on a regular basis. And staff working in those settings know the measures that they need to take should someone present with those. So putting them in a room and keeping them isolated, putting a mask on them, and then the healthcare provider wears the appropriate personal protective equipment. We've also come a long way in terms of the surveillance and the sharing of information globally. So for example, this is a very new virus that's believed to have uh, emerged back in the fall, so in November. Uh, we already have a test for it, which is very different than SARS. You'll remember it was quite a long time before we actually knew what the virus was that was causing it. So there's much more sharing of information, and we have testing that was available very quickly here in Canada as well. And uh, so just on the testing, um, and I, we often hear on the radio, you know, what the numbers are uh, worldwide, num what the numbers are in Canada, and then it, it says currently there are so many people being <laughs> tested. And originally I had heard that, you know, testing was going out to Calgary or something like that, and now I think it's, it's a, a little bit more local, but what's that time frame? So through the chair, uh, so there is a, a network of laboratories that work together globally in order to develop testing. And the tests, because this is a new virus, are evolving on a very regular basis. So persons under investigation uh, for novel coronavirus in Ontario will be tested at the Public Health Ontario Laboratory, which is in Toronto. These specimens, though, are also sent to another lab. So there's the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, and that's uh, a federally operated lab. Um, and so all of those samples are also uh, sent there to be tested in parallel uh, so that they can develop new tests, make sure that things are happening correctly. Um, but we are able to act on the test results that are received in Ontario. 
Oh, okay, and the timeline between um, when somebody, yeah. Yes, through the chair, sorry. Um, the turnaround time for the test is usually between about 24 and 36 hours. Okay, so when we're hearing that there are currently 100 and whatever people that are being investigated and then two, three days later, it could be a different number that those people have gone through um, the system and we were still sitting at seven? Did you say seven in Canada? Uh, yes, so through the chair, um, there are seven people who have tested positive for novel coronavirus in Canada, three of those in Ontario. Uh, two in Ontario have come out of, they were just taken out of isolation, I believe, yesterday. They're testing negative for the virus. They're no longer infectious. Mm -hmm. So people are recovering, which is good news. Um, and that's also what I guess we're, we're hearing more is the, uh, is the recovery rate is, is increasing over, over time uh, globally, which is good. You made the comment about, um, you know, we've come a long way since SARS, yet this has overtaken SARS. Um, and it's, it's generally, I guess, uh, the kind of, the type of virus is, is, is very similar to SARS. If not, there's SARS-like symptoms and SARS-like um, viruses that are containing in, in uh, corona, um, like some other ones too, I think the Middle Eastern. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so through the chair. So coronaviruses are a large group of viruses. Um, and there are ones that circulate in humans. There are ones that circulate in animals as well. And we see seasonal coronavirus every single year. Um, it tends to cause, for most people, mild respiratory symptoms, but in more severe cases, people can get sick, get pneumonias, um, and unfortunately, in some cases, deaths can occur. The ones that are most well known are going to be SARS um, and Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which is the other. They're both coronaviruses as well. Those ones. Um, had fairly severe consequences, so people got very sick with those. And I will say we are still early in this current outbreak, um, so we're seeing it evolve, but right now there appear to be a large number of people infected with uh, what is now called COVID-19, uh, having milder disease, which is quite different than SARS. So if we look at where uh, the number of people impacted by SARS in Canada, significantly higher than what we are seeing with novel coronavirus right now. And I think that's in a large part due to what was learned from SARS in terms of preparedness and acting really quickly to prevent spread within Canada. And I think that that's, um, okay, um, I just, the outbreak that's currently happening, and I've heard pandemic and I've heard epidemic, and th the way it is uh, spreading throughout China and now into into other countries, um, I think we've you know we've obviously done somewhat of a of a good job trying to uh, keep it out of the borders that we here in Canada, but. It's it's still it's still coming in and and it's still spreading at the same time. So I guess we we expect to see more cases, um, and yet we the messaging that we um, we keep sending out to residents is there's um, uh, there's not much to worry about. Uh, wash your hands. Um, it, it's the risk is extremely low, and although I don't want to. Uh, you know, sound the alarms to say everybody, you know, jump into their bunkers. Um, I think that the messaging needs to be a little bit more like um, this is this is an issue, <laughs> and we encourage everybody to continue to, um, you know, wash their hands, lukewarm water for the duration of singing the alphabet, um, and you know, anti antibacterial um, uh, soap uh, where you know, where the options are. In, in currently at the city of Brampton, we've taken all of our antibacterial, um, it's not soap, it's the hand sanitizer um, liquid and put it in front of all of the doors that are coming in and out. And I'd like that to be at, you know, the libraries, the rec centers, the uh, regional buildings. Um, and so is that an opportunity where we can uh, reach out to um, the staff that are at those facilities to encourage that? 
Uh, so through the chair, that's something we would recommend on a regular basis, regardless of novel coronavirus. That's good hand hygiene that will protect people from all of the other respiratory viruses. Currently, in terms of the risk, you know, I do stand by that. Uh, what I've said that the risk of community spread in Peel is low, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is we've seen very little spread right now outside of mainland China. Now. I can't predict the future, but there have been a lot of travel restrictions that have been put in place. There are significantly fewer flights that are leaving mainland China at this point in time, which decreases the risk of spread to other countries. They're also at the uh, Canadian borders, screening that occurs with all passengers coming into Canada, regardless of the type of conveyance, uh, in order to screen and give information to um, uh, let them know what to do if they are showing symptoms and have a relevant travel history, they are taken for assessment. So there are a number of steps that are happening. That being said, you know, we are preparing mm -hmm. in the event that uh, the, this does spread to Canada, that we do start seeing more cases and we do see cases in Peel region so that we will be ready. So certainly, um, you know, any uh, public buildings, we would encourage them to have hand sanitizer available that people can use on a regular basis. At this point in time, influenza is actually more concerning from a public health perspective than the novel coronaviruses. Okay, um, and then just, I guess, the, the last piece about the spread outside of China, there was the ski chalet that a number of people came out of that um, there, was, there was spreading, so it's not, you know, entirely the case of, of yeah, China is the, is the, um, the epicenter, but it's, it's, you know, we, we're hearing a lot of the information that's um, coming out, uh, I guess not, maybe not so much now from China, but, um, uh, other parts in in the world that uh, um, and there's countries that are closing their borders to to China as well. Um, I would just encourage maybe corporate services to, you know, I know that at the city of Brampton, it was um, it was stated that each department would ensure that their hand sanitizer was was filled and and they had um, they had enough on uh, on standby and was constantly being checked to make sure that there was there was enough there. But I'll, I said it at the city, and I'll say it here. I don't know anybody's job description in uh, in the city that says check and refill hand sanitizer. So if there are opportunities where we can have um, people to uh, out there to ensure that these are properly being done from the region's point of view, I would appreciate that. Uh, through the chair, if I can just respond to that, um, facilities has uh, is undertaking that, so that is underway. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Big thanks, Councillor. Uh, I've only been chair for a few seconds already. The councillors are annoying. Uh, okay, uh, next next one up is uh, Councillor Madero. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, uh, thank you very much. I found that the communication of, uh, of um, I guess, the notices and the website, uh, I've reposted everything I can on my social media. Um, just in terms of uh, the coordination from a communication perspective with uh, local schools and, uh, and uh, you know, as Councillor, following up on Councillor Pelleschi's comments, in terms of public uh, buildings, uh, municipalities and so on, uh, can you just uh, speak to that and, uh, and in terms of also, I know you're working closely with our emergency management folks as well, uh, regional staff, so if you can just comment on some of that coordination, how we were in contact. It, through the chair, thank you. Um, so with respect to the local municipalities, all of um, your municipalities have emergency coordinator positions. And so there is a regular teleconference that occurs with our regional emergency management uh, manager with those folks um, in order to discuss any issues, to provide information and share uh, knowledge with them. We also have been in uh, very regular conversation with our school board partners, um, answering their questions, providing uh, to them key messages that they can share with their school community. In addition, the province has also, con they convened a teleconference with all of the directors of education, and in some cases are doing direct conversation to the, uh, uh, the school boards themselves. Thanks very much. Uh Councillor De Merla. Um, thank you, Chair, and uh, 
thank you, Jessica, for the uh, update. It's certainly very reassuring. I just wanted to clarify a couple things because I um, hear different things in the media as well. So one of the things I'm trying to understand is the Novo, it's what's, what's it called, Novo, Novo coronavirus, I think it's, that's what it's called. Is, can you, do we have statistics that compare the infection rate? So uh, is it much more infectious than the common flu? Is it the same? Is it much more infectious than SARS, or is it about the same? And then the mortality rates between SARS and this uh, new virus. Through the chair, um, those are excellent questions and ones that scientists are currently looking at. Uh, in terms of the rate of spread between people, the, the estimates are quite wide at this point in time. And one of the reasons for that is uh, with the type of testing uh, that occurs, they are not able to test people who had very mild symptoms, have completely recovered, and then they're trying to test them yet. They haven't developed the antibody tests for that. You can only test people with symptoms at this point in time. So those very mild cases, like I would imagine when most of you have a cold, you're not going to seek health care. So you would not be tested. So it's very hard for us to tell what the denominator is or the total number of people that have been infected. And so that's one of the reasons we don't have a really firm estimate of how uh, easily this is spread between people. Um, but you know, to give you a sense of it, it is somewhere right now the estimates seem to be around a flu type spread with this, although that may change as we get more information. In terms of the severity, so how many people who get sick are actually dying? Um, so we've now had, uh, you know, a, a significant number of people, 1,300 uh, who've died in largely mainland China. To put it in perspective, there are a billion people in China, so the actual, on a population level, mortality rate is uh, quite low. Uh, when you look at, of all the people who get sick enough that they're presenting to hospital and getting tested, we call that the case fatality rate. The case fatality rate appears to be around two to three percent in uh, Hubei province, which is where the epicenter is and where Wuhan is. Outside in the rest of mainland China, it's about 0.4%. And beyond that, so the rest of the world, they're looking at 0.1 to 0.2%. Um, there are some different reasons why that may be happening. One of the ones that is certainly being looked at is the stress that is being placed on the healthcare system in China right now, may be contributing to a higher case fatality rate than it is in other parts of the world. So uh, how does the 2 to 3% mortality rate compare with the regular flu and then SARS at its peak? Yeah, so the regular flu, the mortality rate of that is about 1% um, to 2%. Um, with respect to SARS, um, the case fatality rate for SARS, uh, I'd have to go back and double check, it was about 7 or 8%. It was higher. So what I'm hearing from you then is that it's a little early, but it might entirely be possible that this new virus isn't any more infectious or any more, uh, I guess, deadly uh, than the common flu, because you're saying 2 to 3% in Wuhan versus 1% or 1 to 2% for the regular flu? Yes, through the chair, that's correct. We're waiting for more information, but that is certainly one of the scenarios. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca. Thank you to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much uh, uh, to you, Dr. Hopkins, and all the staff for the uh, diligence and efficiency in um, keeping us up to date. Uh, my questions were actually around um, comparators to um, the 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 flu, which were answered, uh, but also um, comments around and uh, that Councillor Medeiros and Councillor Pleshi brought up around uh, key messages to the school boards. But in, with regards to uh, um, right now, uh, with, the, with the different um, uh, days off, rotating days off, and municipalities offering one-day camps, um, and also moving into the March break, although it looks like that, uh, um, thankfully, uh, issues of uh, the... Uh, the virus are, have been contained. Um, 
I was just going to ask about questions on those, but it sounds like they have been, uh, you have been working well with the school board and the local municipalities uh, in terms of key messaging. So just wanted to say thank you. And I do think that uh, uh, any questions that have been posed to me by residents, I've been able to direct them to the, uh, to the Peel website. And uh, the key messages have been very informative and simple and easy to understand. So thank you. Thank you. Mayor Thompson. Thank you. It'd be rather quick. Um, Mr. Chair, you'll find this interesting that the largest manufacturer of face masks in the world is from Wuhan. So it's interesting where the epicenter is uh, coming from. With uh, Councillor De uh, uh, DeMarla um, speaking about where it compares to flu and SARS and different things, are Chinese communities really suffering business-wise? And especially with the good information that we've got out that we've got to be diligent, but how do we get past the fear? And is there any suggestions on how, through a medical proportion, that it's good. We need to get out and support this community because it's vital, uh, it's part of Peel, and uh, we, we somehow need to support this community right now, and there's nothing here to fear. So how, through a medical, pro from your medical lens, how do you see how we can help with that? So through the chair, we have reached out to um, the Mississauga Chinese Business Association to discuss with them how we might be able to best support them in terms of uh, spreading facts around this and not supporting misinformation. So we are actively working on that and certainly uh, welcome connections that councillors may have that you feel would be useful for us. Mr. Chair, I'm just wondering if that's just something that as we as region need to set an example and maybe that's something we could figure out on a campaign or something. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Those are all my questions. Can we have receipt of the presentation? Moved by Councillor Sato, seconded by Councillor Sinclair. All those in favor, that is carried. And if Dr. Hopkins will stay in place, we're on to item 8.3, Public Health Annual Review. So I'll just wait, as the presentation's coming up, um, thank you for the opportunity to give you some updates on what public health was up to in 2019. This is part of our provincial requirement um, that includes the provision of an annual performance report. Um, and this presentation and its accompanying report provide an overview, overview of our 2019 activities and introduce some of the preliminary work to advance the 2020 to 2029 Peel Public Health strategic priorities for the future. So you will have seen this image before and it describes the core public health functions according to the Ontario Public Health Standards, and it serves as a reminder of the distinct population health approach that public health uses, which focuses on upstream efforts to promote health and prevent diseases. And using this approach, public health has seen improvements in key areas in the health appeal residents, including improvements in life expectancy, decreases in infectious diseases and chronic diseases, decreases in risk behaviors like smoking and associated consequences such as lung cancer and heart disease. This approach has also been central to addressing some of Peel's remaining public health challenges, including early indicators of the health impacts of climate change, increased rates of emergency department visits for mental health conditions, particularly in youth and young adults, and continued high rates of type 2 diabetes and some of the risk factors associated with it, including physical inactivity and unhealthy eating. The accompanying report provides examples of some of the public health work during 2019. And today I'm going to highlight some of the factors that have made this possible. In particular, uh, your support as the Board of Health for Peel Region on key issues such as the approval of Peel's opioid strategy and the Peel no, Outdoor No Smoking or Vaping Bylaw. Working with our Peel partners, in particular our collaboration with other region of Peel departments, Peel municipalities, healthcare providers and school boards, and answering to local needs is identified through evidence, local data, and consultation. And an example of that was the Peel Public Health Comprehensive Health Status Review Report, which we completed in 2019. This slide provides highlights of the top Peel Public Health organizational risks as reported 
to the ministry in 2019. And these are consistent with items that have been communicated to council already in 2019. They include the potential risk around public health transformation and its multiple impacts, as well as ongoing pressures to meet population needs, engage with the public, uh, meet emerging technological demands and chronic underfunding. And Peel Public Health is hopeful that the ongoing provincial consultations on public health restructuring could open the window for a stronger public health sector in Ontario while leveraging existing capacity in Peel. In 2020, Peel Public Health will continue to monitor these risks and report to regional council as action is required to reduce or mitigate them. I've mentioned before some of the population health challenges for Peel residents, and to strengthen Peel Public Health's capacity to respond on October 24th, Regional Council endorsed the 2020 to 2029 Peel Public Health strategic priorities for the future. These priorities are summarized in this slide, noting that they are areas of work that complement each other and support all other mandated public health work that Peel Public Health will continue. Subsequent reports to Council will occur in 2020 that provide more details on the progress and planned activities. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Are there any questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you very much. If we could have a receipt of the presentation moved by Councillor Mahoney, seconded by Councillor Fonseca. All those in favour, that is carried. Brings me to item 8.4, Peel Housing and Homelessness Plan Overview and Priorities, an oral report from Aileen Baer, Director of Housing Services. Welcome. And the Commissioner Janice Sheehy, welcome. Okay, so good morning, uh, Chairman and members of Regional Council. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I hope to achieve uh, three objectives uh, through my presentation this morning. First, I'd like to provide some context for today's discussion uh, by providing a quick overview of the housing landscape and pressures in Peel. Second, I'd like to discuss the Peel Housing and Homelessness Plan and our priorities for 2020. And third, I'd like to highlight some key considerations related to the reports that went to the Strategic Housing and Homelessness Committee last week and address the direction we received to meet with the two Habitat for Humanity affiliates who delegated at that meeting. So this slide summarizes the current housing landscape and the pressures that we are experiencing in Peel. We know that there are about 1.4 million people living in Peel in about 430 households. Approximately three quarters of those house households own their own homes and, and the remaining one quarter rent. Amongst the households that rent, about 15% are housed through the community housing system. The community housing system provides affordable market and subsidized housing to approximately 17,000 households in Peel. Over the past year, the system has also served approximately 4,000 households experiencing homelessness. The pressures within the housing system, as we all know, are significant and growing. We know that housing prices in recent years have risen much faster than purchasing power. For Peel, that means that the housing market is now afford unaffordable for about 80% of families who want to enter the market today. Given the rising house prices and rents, we also know that more and more households are looking to the community housing system to meet their housing needs. The system was not designed, nor is it funded to meet this growing demand. Wait lists are long and emergency shelters are full and overflowing. Housing as we know is a complex problem that cannot be solved without harmonized policies, cooperation, and funding from all levels of government as well as the private and nonprofit sectors. The region's role when it comes to the community housing sector is fairly robust. So as service manager, regional council does have the power and authority to affect change, but this is under the legislative framework designed by the province. When it comes to market housing, where the vast majority of our residents live, our sphere of influence, in partnership with the local municipalities, is limited primarily to the powers and tools that we have through our planning function. As a result, we will always need to rely on advocacy to improve outcomes. 
So Peel's 10-year housing and homelessness plan is our strategic roadmap to improve housing outcomes in Peel. It was created to do as much as we can within our role and sphere of influence. The plan was approved by Council in April 2018. And looking at the circle on the, on the uh, slide, um, from the outside in, it includes five strategies that are designed to work together to achieve five short-term outcomes and two long-term outcomes that are in the centre of the circle in dark blue. Simply stated, the plan has been created to help more households in Peel get and keep housing they can afford. Now, I apologize, there's quite a bit of content on this slide, um, but it does provide you with an update on the priority actions within the Peel Housing and Homelessness Plan that were approved by Council for implementation in 2019 and 2020. So as the slide shows, we had a number of accomplishments in 2019. The largest and most significant was our housing master plan. The housing master plan is a long-term plan that includes just over 30 projects to build more than 5,300 affordable housing units on Region of Peel and Peel Housing Corporation sites. A financing plan to implement a significant portion of this plan was also approved by Council and I am pleased to say that details about this financing plan will be announced before the end of the month. Yay. <laughs> um, this year, while we continue to implement the housing master plan, which includes opening our new building at 360 City Centre Drive in Mississauga that the Daniels Corporation is building for us, we plan to bring a variety of reports forward to the Strategic Housing and Homelessness Committee and Council as follows. So to increase the supply of affordable housing and to supplement the projects in the housing master plan, my colleagues in planning will be bringing forward a report seeking approval for a new incentives program to encourage more nonprofit and private developers to build affordable housing in Peel, developers like Habitat for Humanity. The program, once launched, will be the new door in for developers interested in working with us to build more affordable rental housing in Peel, replacing the ad hoc approach that's in place today. To further increase supply in ways that do not involve new development, we also plan to implement some of the solutions in our new private stock strategy. The private stock strategy was tabled at last week's Strategic Housing and Homelessness Committee and includes eight relatively quick and cost-effective solutions to add more affordable units to the system, starting with the redesigned second units renovation assistance program that was also tabled at the Strategic Housing and Homelessness Committee last week. In 2020, we will also open the Safe and Transitional House for Survivors of Human Sex Trafficking. And finally, we will continue to transform how we deliver services to our housing and homelessness clients. As I have tried to emphasize in my presentation, and as Council is already very well aware, the pressures on the housing system are significant and growing. Achieving better outcomes requires an intentional focus on what is referred to as keys to success on this slide. To increase supply, we cannot rely on development alone. Development is necessary, but it takes a long time and it's expensive, uh, particular, particularly in Peel where the cost of land is so high. Quicker, simpler, and more cost-effective solutions, like our second unit's renovation assistance program, are therefore needed to supplement our new builds. We need to encourage, we need to continue to encourage the nonprofit and private sector development community to adapt and build affordable housing that meets the biggest needs of our community. Government funding and incentives will go farther, for example, by focusing on rental than home ownership. In terms of transforming service, this involves a shift to a needs-based approach as well as improved coordination with community agencies and health. Council approved these changes in November. Success also requires significant policy changes and investments in technology. And by policy changes, I mean changes to how we run the shelters, changes to how we manage the centralized wait list, and changes to how we administer subsidy. Reports on these changes will be brought to uh, Council before the summer. So that brings me to the approvals that we are seeking from Council today. 
Last week, staff took five reports to the Strategic Housing and Homelessness Committee, the Private Stock Strategy, and the report on the revised Second Units Program provide quicker and more cost-effective solutions to increase supply, particularly when compared to new development. The reports on aligning resources to meet urgent needs, the new shelter beds for single women, and the service enhancements to our outreach program all support our shift to a needs-based approach as the recommendations will help us to immediately improve services to our most vulnerable clients while alleviating pressures in the homelessness system, all in a fiscally responsible manner that does not impact the tax rate. As we've previously reported to Council, the Peel Family Shelter was in overflow every week in 2019. That's unheard of. 11 new street homeless encampments were discovered by our outreach team in 2019. We could wait to address these issues through the 2021 budget process, but members of this council have asked, asked us to act with urgency and to take action now. The committee endorsed the recommendations in the four reports, but deferred the report entitled Housing and Homelessness Services aligning resources to urgent needs to today's council meeting. This was done out of respect for the two Habitat for Humanity affiliates who delegated at the meeting and who requested more time to work with staff to find a compromise. I am pleased to report that we did just that. Uh, we were able to reach an agreement with both Habitat for Humanity affiliates, which includes extending a final one-time tranche of funding in 2020 $600,000 to Habitat GTA for a 12-unit project in Brampton, and $400,000 to Habitat Halton Mississauga, which will contribute to an innovative shared housing project that they're currently working on in Mississauga. Both affiliates have written letters to the region expressing their support for the new agreements, and those letters are on today's agenda. Two more points before I wrap up. First, I do want to emphasize that the recommendation to repurpose funds in the housing services budget was in no way intended to signal that we do not value our partnership and all of our partners, especially Habitat for Humanity. We look forward to working with them in new ways in the future, primarily through our new incentives program, should it be approved by Council later this year. The recommendations were made to provide Council with an option during a time of significant budget constraint to achieve better outcomes without impacting the tax rate. $90,000 per door previously gave us one new home. $90,000 in the second units program gives us three new rental units while helping three other families retain their homes in a more affordable manner. Finally, a council approval of the recommendations in the report on today's agenda is needed in order for staff to repurpose funds within the housing services budget. Without this approval, staff will not be able to implement the new programs and service enhancements recommended in the other reports. I'm happy to take any questions and thank you very much. Thank you and I have a list, Councillor Fonseca. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. So looking to clerks, I believe this is the appropriate time for me to bring forward um, a resolution. Uh, bring forward a resolution. So move receipt of the presentation, uh, but bring forward a resolution and bring forward 15.2, 15.3, 16.3, 3, and 16.4. Okay, so uh, perhaps we could get the resolution on the screen. Um, and first off, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Eileen, to staff, to Janice, um, to the committee, um, also to Habitat GTA and Habitat Halton Mississauga for the, uh, I think, um, very productive uh, discussion and debate that we had at the um, committee meeting last week. Um, I do want to thank staff for recognizing in all the reports um, the, and I think Councillor Medeiros expressed it in terms of a tsunami 
uh, that we are being hit with in, in terms of the crisis when it comes to uh, affordable housing in the system. Having the, the family shelter on Dundas in Ward 3, I know uh, the uh, crisis situation that we're in there and having Cothra, the Cothra shelter just outside of uh, uh, the ward uh, and also having our place Peel um, in Ward 3, I know the situation we are being faced with um, and all the other councillors uh, recognized the uh, the demands and the needs that were being put uh, that are being put on us, uh, and that we have to act now. Um, I do. Uh, I do want to thank staff that the report and the recommendations um, as to where to shift the resources and the redistribution addressed all. Uh, addressed all of what uh, council uh, was asking for you to address. So I want to thank you for that. At the same time, and you've acknowledged it and it was discussed last week, um, and Habitat uh, GTA and Halton Mississauga also address this, that there it has been a great collaboration over many, many years. Um, between uh, Habitat and Peel in trying to address the housing situation in Peel and filling housing needs along the continuum. And they also demonstrated in their presentations last, or deputations last week, that they too are wanting to and willingly looking at trying to adapt their model in a collaborative way. And I think it, it came out last week that it's very important that uh, we all need to be working together in as collaboratively a way as possible, both in the short term and in the longer term for finding ways to address uh, the housing situation that we are facing in Peel. Um, so I do want to thank staff for meeting with Habitat um, and for coming up with uh, this, uh, this solution. Um, the ask was also that um, the funding that is in the report, the recommendations in the report, um, not be altered, like the actual programming funding. Um, so um, as Eileen, as you mentioned, 600,000 to the GTA, uh, Halton G uh, Habitat GTA and 400,000 to Halton Mississauga um, was discussed as a, um, a, a 2020 opportunity moving forward. But I just want you to reaffirm that that funding does not have an impact on the tax, uh, the 2020 tax um, and the budget, uh, that there is no impact on the, the other recommendations and the original recommendations in the report, and that um, if you could just explain maybe where that funding is coming from for, for, uh, for the rest of council, that would be greatly appreciated. So thank you, Councillor Fonseca, and through the chair, I'll start, and then maybe Aileen, if I'm missing anything, you can just fill in the blanks. So there is a million dollars that is currently in the base budget for operations in housing. We believe that we can use that million dollars to assist Habitat for Humanity. We will not need it in 2020 because we will be taking that time to redesign the Second Suites program. Okay. So we do have the ability to cash flow that out to Habitat for Humanity. Okay. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, I see there's other speakers on the board, so I will leave it at that for now. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And so um, I want to thank staff for the report. I want to thank uh, uh, Councillor Fonseca for bringing this up as well. I just want to reiterate some of the comments I made last week, um, uh, that this is something very much overdue uh, in the Peel region. It'll help tackle two uh, prominent issues that we're facing, particularly in Brampton, which is uh, uh, affordable rentals and illegal basements. Um, you know, we've seen uh, an uptick in people registering their second units in the past uh, couple of years. Uh, and as Councillor Medeiros mentioned last week, this is a, a housing crisis that has gripped uh, the Peel region as a whole. So I'm very glad the um, uh, staff was able to come up with a, a, a good resolution. Uh, with uh, Habitat uh, for Humanity, and I'm glad uh, Councilor Fasenko was able to move it last week. And so uh, just a question for just uh, the process here. Um, with 8.4, are we also bringing up um, 15, 1, 2, and 3? Okay, so that's all moved by Councilor Fasenko, is that correct? Okay, if I can just 
request, would I be able to move 15.3? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parrish. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I also just, I wanna compliment the Daniels group on their building in city center. They didn't just throw up a cement block or chrome and glass. They've really put some design thought into it. So affordable housing doesn't have to be ugly housing. So yeah, I'm very, very impressed with what they've done. I have to drive by it every day. And uh, I don't know whether you controlled it or they controlled it, but it's a good job all around. The other concern I had with this, and I've talked quite a bit with the people that do, with uh, our commissioner of, of uh, planning and the people that do our housing plans. As you probably are aware, uh, the mayor of Mississauga put a group together and we met every two months in Port Credit for about a year and a half. There were people from the ministry, people from developments and so forth. In the end of all that, we came up with 40 ideal plans to bring in more affordable housing. Um, we know that the region does the subsidized housing. We are hoping that we can put some plans in place that we do affordable issues for the middle. Um, people earning, families earning less than 100,000 a year. One of the things that's happening in my ward right now with the LRT and everything else that's going on is there's whole bunches of condos going up here in Ontario. And we got Liberty voluntarily to give us 124 affordable condos. Uh, they don't want to manage them, and they'll probably get Habitat to be the rental agent for them. So what we're hoping to get is um, a couple meetings between you and our people on two issues. One is how we can further pull teeth out of these guys and get units. I know uh, Councillor Dasco got quite a, a good buy out of the Lakeview deal. We increased their density, we increased some heights, and we got prizes for it. But we need to eventually put something in place that's that's more a legal base than what we're doing right now. And you're the experts there, so I am, they asked me to ask you if we could work together on that. Um, the other thing uh, they wanted to caution was the rules that you're designing for basement apartments. Before the province made basement apartments legal for Ontario, we had a process to make them legal in Mississauga that produced, I think over three years, five registrations. It was a joke. It was far too intricate. The, the costs for doing it were far too high. There was no subsidy for doing it. It was a bit of a mess. So they are hoping that you look at that, all our bad experiences carefully, and then look at what we're doing now. I don't think in the end, you're going to get the number of registrations that we hope for. Um, our people uh, guessed Five years ago, we have 33,000 illegal units, or they were at the time. And people that are renting those are using them to subsidize their income. They don't want to pay more income tax. They don't want to pay more property tax. So there's a strong hesitation to register them. Um, but we're getting way more now because our criteria now is mostly safety. It's fire. It's uh, ability to have, a, a you know, no no uh, diseases or, or what do you call it, um, mold and other uh, damp air. So um, I would hope when you look at your, your development or your subsidies for second units that you take a look at all the experience we had first because there's absolutely no point in reinventing that wheel. And um, I've gone through the report well. I'm glad that you had Habitat come into the meeting last week because they initially were very anxious and they seem fine now. So I thank you very much. Good job. And you do way better when I'm off the committee. Councillor Santos. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'm sure that uh, you know that the City of Brampton, in terms of our secondary unit registration process, uh, we just received statistics today from staff. Um, the registration for us is skyrocketing. They have found a really good sweet spot in terms of incentives to get people to um, actually register. Um, I think we have something over 3,000 now registered um, in a short period of time, so that's very encouraging. There's a lot to learn uh, definitely there. The one thing I do want to bring up, though, and I brought it up in our budget discussions um, with Brampton and also with the AMO Task Force on Affordable Housing, is that even though this has no impact on property taxes now, the secondary unit program that the province is introducing will have an impact on services. 
and eventually put a strain on the property tax base. So as we're looking at this, we should look at what, as people are registering into secondary units, we should look at what the strain is for infrastructure, transit, community services, et cetera, and make that part of our advocacy to the province when it comes to our affordable housing fair share for the region of Peel. If we're implementing these creative solutions, what we don't want is this to be another opportunity to download um, it, like issues and services back onto the region and onto our municipalities as well. So if we can keep track of numbers, um, that would be great for us when we advocate for more funding uh, to the province. Um, the, uh, and that's it. My other questions for the other report coming up. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Oh, uh, Councillor Santos uh, stole a lot of my thunder. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, we, we had uh, 3,100 uh, exactly uh, come for registration. Uh, 2,519 uh, were approved uh, secondary units. So um, it's, it's quite a popular avenue um, for owners as well. Uh, you know, I have an area, um, the houses are uh, executive running 1.7, 1.8. And uh, I started getting calls six months after they moved in about transit. And it wasn't for them, it's for all the basements coming there. So um, it's, it's quite, a, quite an issue, but we've um, made a lot of headway. Uh, we are looking at also, we just had a public consultation on February 10th of uh, looking to eliminate the parking, additional parking requirement uh, to encourage um, people who rent basements uh, the opportunity to use public transit and many don't have cars. I, I'm personally dealing with uh, this issue as well. So it's promising, obviously, the numbers you shared, uh, three times the number of units for the same level of investment. If we talk about a return on investment for the taxpayer, this this is a big part of that, uh, secondary units. So um, I did have one question. The only thing I was confused about for the... Peel re renovate second units. I see 1.5 million was given to 66 homeowners. So how much are homeowners getting on average through this program? Because that seems like uh, a lot per. Through you, Chair, I'm first going to have to seek some clarification um, as to what you're referring to. Are you referring to the existing Peel renovations yeah, just Second I was curious. Program, I, I didn't or understand. Or is yeah. it the Home and Peel Down Payment Assistance Program? It's the Peel Renovate Second Unit Renovation Assistance Program, page 15.2-5, uh, outputs. Right, okay. So the, there were, the existing program provides yeah. a forgivable loan up to $15,000. Okay. Okay, and it is for a similar purpose. Now, the existing program, though, doesn't have any affordability criteria. Okay. And so part of what we want to do with the new program is yeah. completely redesign it. Okay. Um, really create it to be a mechanism to increase affordable housing. But yeah. we're also going to... Um, make the amount of a forgivable loan available through the program more. Um, but we're going to slide it. So um, this is actually a conversation we've already had with the local municipality partners about the design of the program and the final criteria. We do want to make it simple to bring in an affordable unit. Uh, but if, if a homeowner is prepared to do more, um, to house one of our clients, we'll actually increase the amount of forgivable loan by another $10,000. So I'm now not answering your original question. <laughs> uh, but, but I'm it okay really if was, that's... It was the loans that were given. That yeah. was how many households participated in the previous program. Okay. Yeah, just even though, you know, if it, there's a streamlined process that's easy for people to follow, a little bit less, and then obviously if they're going to take on some of the clients, I, I agree with that. They should receive more. Um, but f even 15000 some people just need like that little bit of help, like 5000 even, you know, to hire an architect these days. You got to do, the process isn't easy, and the municipal code, sorry, the building code is quite complex. The fire code is complex. Um, so even a little bit uh, in a streamlined process would, would go miles away. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Thompson. Going forward, I hope this is a living document uh, because new innovations and new ideas come in. I hope that's what we're looking at. I know we're coming with it, but it's still open for newer opportunities similar with Habitat, correct? Absolutely, through you, Chair. 
we do, we do need to be innovative, and that has been our message to Habitat and all of our partners. We need to work together to adapt and innovate. The problem's too complex otherwise, so I can assure you that uh, we are always looking for new ideas. I think Habitat coming forward like this, I think, is sometimes the best way to uh, re-energize. Affordable housing is many things to many people. But I will tell you, when it comes to affordable ownership, and, it, and it, when you talk about affordable housing, to whom are we talking about? But for a, affordable housing ownership, there isn't a better concept than the Habitat for Humanity, but it's how do you grow it? It's so small in such a way. Is, you know, how can we ever grow that to be able to serve the needs is, is the real question. So I think that's the one issue that I, I, I'm glad it's been relooked at, but I, I do want to... Uh, do a shout out for Habitat, but it's something that I think we just can't rust on our laurels, is how can we build on that similar concept to be able to grow that out, to be able to serve more people, because that's really your true affordable housing of anything that we've got, you know, for home ownership. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, that exhausts my list, but Mayor Thompson, the other point that I would add, and it came up at committee as well, is the fact that the other advantage of Habitat for Humanity is they're our poster child for doing the right thing. Yeah. They get a such, um, we could otherwise build a brand new 200 unit affordable housing unit and I built them in my ward and you predominantly get yelled at. Suddenly Habitat for Humanity shows, oh, is this the right thing to do? Well, it's remarkable, the, the bang for the, and that's why I'm so grateful to Janice and Eileen and we were to sit down with Habitat. Uh, Councillor Parrish, thanks for your help as well uh, on the file uh, to get this over the hump and give them a little bit more time to transition as well. So I think good work done by all. Uh, with that, I have three motions before me. The first is the one you see on the screen moved by Fonseca and Dylan. I will take it as read and I need an electronic vote, please. Madam Clerk, that carries. Very good. The second motion I have, that being 15.2, had been moved by Carlson, but I think I'm going to have it moved by Fonseca and seconded by Vicente this time. You don't have it before the screen, so I'll read it for you, that the Active Living Design Elements Grant Program, Affordable Housing Capacity Building Grant Program, Habitat for Humanity Grant Agreement, with the exception of two one-time funding for two Habitat for Humanity affiliates, Home and Peel Down Payment Assistance Program, and Peel Renovates Homeowners Renovation Assistance Program be discontinued, and further that $1,717,500 in housing support-based operating budget from the discontinued programs be reallocated to fund the new My Home Second Unit Renovation Program, and further that regional funds in the Home and Peel Deferred Revenue Account, fund additional units in the new My Home Second Unit Renovation Program as required, and further that $2,500,000 in homelessness support base operating budget from the discontinued programs be reallocated to fund service level increases in outreach and adult shelter contracts and the new women's shelter beds in Brampton. You've heard the motion. Electronic vote, please. And that carries. And finally, motion 15.31, moved by Councillor Dillon, seconded by Councillor Carlson, that the report of the Strategic Housing and Homelessness Committee meeting held on February 6, 2020, be adopted. Electronic vote to approve. Oh, just a show of hands for the committee report. All those in favor, that carries. Thank you very much to all. Well done. Okay, that concludes the presentations and the delegations. We're on to committees. Items related to enterprise programs and services. Councillor Fonseca. Thank you, through Mr. Chair. We had um, a direction item held under communications. Uh, Rob Flack, President and Chairman of the Board of the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair Letter with direction. Uh, Councillor Vincent. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a pleasure for me to nominate uh, Mayor Thompson to be our representative at the Royal Board of Governors for the 2020 year. Okay, thank you very much. We do need a seconder, seconded by Councillor Downey. Um, is this a show of hands or a recorded vote? Or a recorded, recorded vote? Pardon? He's making fun of me. Okay. Ah, there, it's on the screen.
And thank you very much. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Moving on to items related to public works. Madam Clerk, did we have one remaining on that file? That was dealt with, wasn't it? Very good. So that takes us to items related to health. Chair Downey. Sorry, my apologies. Councillor Sato, you wanted to go back on 10.3. Is that not correct? I have Councillor Sato written here. Uh, Daniel, legislative court, excuse me, letter Good dated. timing as I'm joking. My apologies. <laughs> that, that was my fault. I went past that. Yes. Councillor Fonseca, back over to you for item 10.3 that <laughs> Councillor Sato did okay. note. I okay. apologize. Okay, for, thank, for, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I missed it too, so. Um, yes, uh, Stephen has informed me that we did pass a motion back in December making this request, so I think it was just a matter of what we did in December, and then this didn't come until February. <laughs> um, but just to repeat again, um, and I guess reiterate the motion. So we did give direction in December for us to do our budget first before both municipalities. So yes. that yeah, that's the chair, already done. In effect, the motion that's here or in the Mississauga motion is consistent with the direction that Regional Council provided at the conclusion of the budget on December 19th. Okay. That's fine. So I'm just reiterating that then, as you said. It doesn't hurt to repeat and remind, right? Thank you. And just on that, and we've already met with the, our colleagues and are working on the process. Okay, great. So, yeah, don't, don't confuse us with timing on these motions coming after we've dealt with them. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Councillor Fonseca, so that deals with that. Thank that you. brings us back, back to, to Councillor Downey to deal as chair with health. Chair Thank Downey. you. Through you, Chair. Um, item 13.1, Region Appeal Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan Development Update. Um, for information, just I'd like to take a moment um, before that update uh, just to thank the staff that are leading, um, leading this work. Uh, it's not easy to have so many community stakeholders around so many tables and to bring everybody together. Um, and I think it's moving quite well. Councillor Santos. Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, as we put the strategy together, I just, I think, uh, and I'm sure everyone knows this is already, but we do need far more outreach support on the ground um, w with respect to mental health, with respect to um, those who are transient and homeless, et cetera. We are lacking the outreach um, on the ground. So I just, I just wanted to highlight that. My other question is on the action tables on page 13.1-3. Um, there's a list of organizations here. I, I, I'm just making an assumption, even though it wasn't acknowledged in the report that we're talking to the school board, schools, principals, et cetera, in this conversation on the action tables? Through the chair, yes. We, are, uh, we have a fairly broad-based membership on all our tables, and the school boards definitely are involved. Okay, great, because uh, we had our, our round table on mental health, as I mentioned before, um, in the schools talking to principals. Many of them didn't know that this, uh, the action table on family violence existed. And so it would be great to have more of those voices um, at the table uh, because a lot of our schools need support with dealing with student mental health issues. Um, the other piece here is on um, do, 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 providing, on page three, providing education Awareness on systemic discrimination, equity, and inclusion. Anti, for example, anti-oppression training for senior leaders. Um, in the city of Brampton, in our diversity, equity, and inclusion report and recommendations, we amended it to also include bystander training, which is a new thing. If we could also look at the region for bystander training as well, that would be fantastic. Um, the thing with bystander training is you find you end up with more volunteers willing to take the training because it's essentially training to call other other people out on their anti-oppression and racism, et cetera. Um, and what they found is that once you're able to recognize what somebody else is doing, you are less likely to do it yourself. And so um, if we could include bystander training in there as well, that would be great. Thank you, Councillor Sato. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, and, and I'm glad you held this because I wanted it held as well. Um, I, I want to comment on uh, Councillor Downey and Pileshi and I sit on the committee, and I am so impressed with the work that is being done. You know, when um, when we were first told that the province required us to put together this strategy, one of my comments was, I hope it's not, we're not just going to go through the exercise because we have to and come up with a strategy that's going to sit on a shelf. And I have to say that we have really taken all the people that are involved and that have been attending all of the meetings and working together on the, pro on the um, action plan have really contributed so much. And when this comes to regional council with the full strategy and recommendations, I think council is going to be very impressed with the amount of work that has been done, but more than that, the um, recommendations and the action plan that is going to come out of it. It's not just going to be a, you know, we did it, it was a nice thing to do. The dialogue that um, at, at the last meeting, and I, I would think my colleagues that sit on the committee agree with me, was, um, was really enlightening. We had some really excellent discussion. And I, I guess part of, you know, at listening to, um, to the Councillor um, Santos comments, I think it's very aware that members of council, apart from these reports, aren't really aware of all the good work that's going on there. Um, and I, I don't know, are we sharing the minutes of the meetings with other members of council other than the three of us? Somebody, not sure who can answer that. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, uh, through the chair. We, no, we have, we, we have over 40 individual members, over 25 organizations represent, so they get the notes and, and right. all the materials, but we haven't formally engaged in a process to share with beyond that. We're still in the kind of the development stages, yeah, so I realize you, that. we have a little need to be careful there, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just wondering because some of the discussion, I think it would be good for members of council to be aware of those issues that we are talking about, the priorities that have been developed. So maybe um, maybe there's some way that we can have that information uh, somewhere on a private part of the region's website even that members of council can be given a link to that uh, they can go and read it or share the minutes with, uh, with members of council. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it, I, I think it would be helpful, and then they, our colleagues here, they may look and say, well, maybe there's something that they see missing that they would like to mm -hmm. ask us to take a look at, <coughs> and either ask one of the three of us to, to bring it forward or ask staff to bring it forward. It's a really important project, and, you know, this, this entire initiative is really what we need it to be doing as we're combating violence within the region of Peel. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is such a key part of that whole, um, whole initiative and will to, uh, to prevent violence. So um, I, I want to congratulate staff. You know, it's, it's been an excellent exercise and uh, everyone who's been involved with it has been really involved. So thank you. I'm, I, I'm enjoying being on it and um, and participating and hearing from the many organizations. You know, we don't always have to reinvent the wheel. We are the wheel <laughs> right here in that in that group. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sato. Um, may I suggest that at an appropriate time a more robust update comes back with staff presentation to this council? That work? And just further to Councillor Santos's uh, comments regarding involvement from our um, anchor stakeholders in the community, I think uh, this, the involvement of the school boards is, is vitally important. And it hit me the other day when I was watching CP24 um, and getting the strike updates. Uh, Peel has 160,000 students in our school system. That's more than a tenth of our population in our school system. So the involvement from the school board, I think, is is crucial, um, and we hope uh, to see them at the table um, moving forward. Thank you, Councillor Downey. I think that ends the committee, and it 
ends all committees, brings me down to item 19, other business. Councillor Parrish, the matter you raise with regards to the article in the pointer, a regional taxpayer is funding more than 6,000 paramedic visits to Toronto Pearson Airport. Please, if you'd like to introduce the yes, subject. Yes, yes. Um, this is actually um, a project. It's an uplifting project I'd like us to get a report on. Um, this is an excellent article. Um, I got it early this morning, and it shows, first of all, before we get started, um, we pay, uh, as a region, all the paramedic calls that go into the airport. And if you see my crazy math on the cover, there were 6,799 calls in 2019 at $775 a call. So $5.2 million or $5.3 million. Um, police and fire are in-house at the airport, and police are paid by the airport, by the GTAA. So my first question would be, why aren't we putting... Uh, giving them a bill because we don't get, we're one of only five airports in all of Canada that doesn't get market value taxes. We get pilts based on the traffic, people going in and out of the airport. And it takes three years for the numbers to catch up to what we get paid. And when we do get paid, there's a, a cap on the increase of 5%. When SARS hit a few years ago, the travel crashed, we, they went down something like 21%, and our pilts went down three years later by 21%. There's no cap going down. So that's my little rant on the airport. I do it on a fairly regular basis because it's in my ward and because I was part of the federal government that said all federal buildings will pay market value tax, and then Mr. Harris exempted five airports. Uh, to make matters worse, um, they set our per head amount at 94 cents in 2001, and I've never changed it. Mm -hmm. uh, London, Ontario gets $1.70 a head, just to give you some perspective, because they have a different uh, an agreement. So I looked at this and was quite fascinated by the fact that in 2000, Vancouver put a paramedic station in their airport, and they whip around on bicycles, and they do a fantastic job, and they cut out 60 or 70% of the need to have an ambulance come. Mm -hmm. Then Pierre Elliott Truo Airport did it in 2018, and I have to thank the pointer for this. I had no idea. And uh, they cut their uh, deliveries to hospitals by 40%, or I think 40% needed to go, so I, they cut it by 60%. So the question I want to leave with us is to see if we can get our folks, our paramedics, and it's uh, supported by the union president on the last page, to quickly get a study of all the stats from those two airports and see if we can implement that at Pearson, put in a station, get paramedics on bicycles of all things or little scooters uh, to take care of it. Because they said most of the problems that they have to deal with are things like fatigue, anxiety, stress, geez, they must come to council meetings. Fatigue, anxiety, stress, pre-existing health conditions, diabetes, asthma, blood pressure. So I would recommend, and I don't, didn't want to do a motion because I just got it today, that we ask our paramedics if they would get those two studies done and come back with some sort of estimation on what it would cost us to implement the same thing at Pearson. Then while I was also on the subject, um, I had a public meeting with the new police chief a couple of weeks ago and he talked about going to the mustering first thing in the morning of the platoons. And he said where he's supposed to have 50 officers, he's got 24 on a regular basis because of mental health leaves, because of tr extra training. And, and I'm just wondering if we have the same sort of attendance with our peel, peel paramedics. And I would like to know uh, I know Councillor Downey and I are asking for these on a regular basis, an update on the mental health programs that are there for the Peel paramedics, and uh, look at, at their attendance rates at uh, beginning of shift every day, uh, and just see why people are there, how many are missing, and so forth, because it must be a heck of a strain. But uh, if, if they're 5% of all their calls are going to the airport, and we're paying for them, and those are probably not even Peel Regional citizens. They're from all over the GTA. So that was, uh, there's no need for nervousness. It was a positive thing. And I'm hoping that we can get a report back sooner rather than later. And we... Put that right through to staff. Carolyn, when can we expect a response on all of the above? 
to the chair, uh, Brian Laundry, acting on behalf of Commissioner Kathy Granger. Uh, thank you for uh, for those comments, Councillor Parrish. Certainly, PRPS, our paramedic services, are aware of it. Uh, all the work that has been done in multiple jurisdictions. We've done lots of reviews. We continue to work with the airport on models of service provision that will optimize our efficiency, our effectiveness, uh, addressing the issues that you spoke to. Uh, we've altered the model of service delivery in 2018. We, we've evaluated that. We find we need to improve and continue to work further on it. Uh, and, and uh, Deputy Chief Gibson's here if, if you're interested in any more details on, on that planning. For 2020, uh, this, uh, this planning continues to be within the strategic planning and the operational planning of the, of the uh, paramedic services. Uh, and we're working together to advance that continually. Uh, in terms of reporting, we can bring that back at, at, at some point as part of our regular reporting, perhaps in the fall, but I can assure you we're working on it. Uh, if you want to have more information related to the fi financial component, but perhaps the Commissioner of Finance can chip in. But. No, I, I, this sounds like an elaborate report, and I would never spring a, quest a question on you that I needed an answer to today. The answer I need, and I don't want to wait till the fall, would be what sort of absentee rate do we have? For what reasons? Are we at full platoon in the mornings or at each shift? I, that one is a separate question and happy to have it back in a month if that's how long it takes. I'm sure it won't. But secondly, I really would like us to look into this model for delivering service to the airport. I don't like giving them $5 million of our taxpayers' money. And if it's a better system and it works better and uh, it relieves some of the pressure on our paramedics, that are putting 5% of their calls in there every day, uh, I think we need to look at it. So I'd like that back as soon as you can. And, and thank I, you, Mr. Chair. Yes, and Councillor Parrish, just to be clear, the fall for the broader perspective, but certainly in this session before our break, I know we're already into February, but before June, I would hope some of that, if not sooner, could get back to us, because I think they're pretty simple questions to get a perspective on. So can we commit to that? Uh, sure, we can. Just, I don't want to call it quick yeah. and dirty, but you know no. what I mean. Uh, and, and through the chair, that's fine. We can bring you back to progress today. It's, it's, it's multi-jurisdictional, and it's just not up to us to, de to, de to define the model, so we have to work in collaboration with all our partners and bring, get to a, a good result together. So as far as we can get before June, how about we, uh, it would be okay to report on, on that progress very at good. that time. Thank okay. you very much. So and that's taken Through you, direction. Mr. Chair, you're talking about the bicycle on-site thing for, and, by June? Any, any of the models that uh, we've, we've reviewed in terms of improving service at the airport. People who know me well know that the airport irritates the heck out of me. <laughs> so if there's anything we can do to cut our costs there, I'd, I'd appreciate it. And we'll be able to, uh, through the chair, bring uh, an attendance uh, information Very much good. sooner. Very good. Thank you. That brings us down to the bylaws. I have a motion moved by Madero, seconded by Councillors Madero and Fortini, that the bylaws listed on February 13, 2020, Regional Council Agenda, being bylaws 8 2020 to 12 2020 inclusive, be given the required number of readings, taken as read, signed by the Regional Chair and the Deputy Regional Clerk, and the corporate seal be affixed there too. All those in favor? That carries. We have an in-camera matter that's here strictly for receipt. I, I don't believe there's a reason to go in camera if someone's willing to move receipt. Mayor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Sinclair. All those in favor of receipt of the in-camera. Very good. And finally, moved by Parrish, Councillor Parrish, seconded by Councillor Groves, that bylaw 13-2020 to confirm the proceedings of regional council at this meeting held on February 13, 2020, and to authorize the execution of documents in accordance with the region appeal bylaws relating thereto, be given what required number of readings taken as read, signed by the regional chair and the deputy regional clerk and the corporate seal be affixed there too. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. A motion to adjourn from Councillor Singh and Councillor Dillon. Carried. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful family day week. End.